Ich habe mich im Moment einiges von einem um Easy Hits Lace zocken. Du musst auch mal ganz viel in den Richtung holen. Ja, in der Weg, das ist nie. Okay, dann nehme ich mal sein, dass es Kitsch holt. Ja, aber das ist Kitsch. Ich schlage da dünn. Ich kann auch die Meinung dünn, wenn du Kitsch holst. Ich bin da so können dünn. Okay, ist der wahnsinnigste Person, was er an sich Nee, ik verga hier. Misschien staan die twee niet op. Hier is het dit. Ik zal de slide even aanpassen. Het puntje vier. 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 Die vragenlijst van de quiz ingevuld van de TDM? Ja, half, ja. Zo doe ik nog naar het, het raarste moment dat ik weet dat gaat op TDM. Die heb ik dus leeggelaten. Wat? Die heb ik dus leeggelaten. Okay. Ik heb er één gezet dat ik ooit door studenten ben gevraagd om uh, te doen als ik dood op de voeten. In de gang. Hé, <lacht> <lacht> ja, dat. Ja. Dan heb je zo'n mooie clip van, je ligt op die hoogte. <lacht> en wij staan daar zo te brullen en Jori komt zo naast hem staan. En hij zegt letterlijk, ik ga geen vragen stellen, loop over heen en ga naar buiten. Dat is veel te lopen over mijn zon die aan de bal is. Ik denk dat er wel een watermachine is. Voor de watermachine werken we niet. Nee, die zit er niet uit. Slim. Ik ga het nu eens zeggen. Oké.
con bố con tính vào đấy Yeah. 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 Ja, want klikken op één knopje is ook zo heel moeilijk. Hè? Zit jij, hoor. <laughs> nu weet ik nooit. Hè. Wat is er een mens in mijn gesprek die ik niet ken? Uh, een vraag, ja. Dat is dan weer het voordeel van een uh, publieke event. Hè? <laughs> ja, dat wel. Oh, Daarom heb ik daar juist de link even verspreid op Fortune. En, uh... <laughs> Staat de audio en zo op? Uh, ja, alles gedaan. Uh, ik heb juist ook een recording gehad, die was ook in orde. Ja, toch? Ja. ja. Met, met de, de kwaliteit. Dat dat ding geeft. Sure, met de slides en de dingen zijn naast. Ja, dat? maar dat was omdat er nog maar twee mensen aanwezig waren. Als jij. Um... Oh, even kijken, ik ga eens even. Hier zit je. Je hebt enerzijds deze en deze. Ja, okay. Maar als er meerdere mensen gaan joinen, weet ik niet wat die hier. Uh, ja. En dat hebben we niet onder controle, want dat is Nee, maar deze is eigenlijk op die computer. Die? Ja, en dat is de audio ook. Dus ja. je hebt normaal gezien het geen van de audio van mij komt. Ja, normaal gezien wel, ja. Maar het... okay. <coughs> maar ik zou er toch niet meer leven om durven te gokken. <laughs> kunnen de mensen die er al zijn misschien eens via de chat bevestigen uh, dat ze alles kunnen horen? <laughs> Alles. Alles. En dank u wel, Pieter. Uh. Oh, wat dan het geluidje. <laughs> En er blijven mensen nog tussenin gooien en dan zet ik wel even. Of dan duurt het nog om de tanden, hè? Ik heb toch drie moord, hè? Blijf je niet? Ah, hier niet. Dat is gewoon opzij. Ah, ja, ja, dat is toch wel. Dat is gewoon dat is... de bocht in plaats van het systeem aan te passen, doe het gewoon daar. Dat is toch wel. Dat is toch wel een interessante. Interessante methodologie. Niet te veel hebben gezien. <laughs> oh. Dat is. Ik kan dat ook voor ons zeggen, dan denk ik daar gewoon goed in. <laughs> nee, sorry. Dit not happen. Breng ah. <laughs> <laughs> anders nog om naar Luna, helpt. 
So, von das ist hinter dich so hart, ob ich dann am Land sind, dann da gar nicht so recht. Ich habe nicht so reden, dass die nicht viel ist, die aber am Land sind, dann kommen. Das hat nicht damit ein bisschen mit Hütten. Das könnte das mit da sein. Ja, irgendwie ein Wort mehr in die Küche. In Staatsgeheimen. Ja, bitte. Ich habe nichts, wo wir uns Well, ob wir vieles lieben. Ich habe noch ein bisschen Wumpf ausgeschaut. Ah, echt? Gott. Ich verkomme vorher an alle Freunde, dass sie nur die Elemente an Risiken sind. Ja, ja, ja. Sollte ich immer so eine Präsentation machen? Das ist alleen dann der Sorgscode von der Website. Da wel. Dat was ook alleen maar voor mensen die weten wat source code van de website is. <laughs> Dank u wel, Eva. Oh boy. Oh hey, Eva. Zullen we hier maar buiten? Zeg je het niet? Ja. Ik ja. <laughs> ja. En hier is ook niet eens. Dat is een van de voorzitters van de Quick Working Group. Ja. Genau. Just to make things interesting. Mm-hmm. And fun. <sighs> Why? Why did I agree to this? Hey, Robin. Hello. <laughs> I have no idea who's talking. <laughs> Can you hear me, mystery voice? <laughs> of course we can. I'm just waiting a bit for uh, you to figure out who it is. But this is kind of hard. <laughs> oh, I think it's Oliver, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, have, you have a distinct accent. And, and welcome, of course. Very sad to see the uh, very empty auditorium. <laughs> but good to see you. You and me both. <laughs> I was just saying, it's if, if I had to do this from home, <laughs> I would probably have postponed it. <laughs> this is terrible, but yeah. So I assume you're still flying us there for some beer at some point, right? I'm still what? That's what so I was flying us about. down there for some beer, I guess. Oh, yeah, time, of course. Right? That's Somewhere. Part of the package, I thought. In about 12 months, that should be possible. Uh, <laughs> That's on record, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> it's, it's all being recorded, so. Uh, oh. And uh, bedankt, Chris. And dag, mama and papa. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Wat is gewoon? Het is het niet waard. Nee. Ja, het ding is, dat is zomaar een eenmalig moment in je carrière. Hè? Uh-huh. Dat is lekker een best goed verdienen of een last goed verdienen. Ik heb er niet zo warme herinneringen aan door een bepaald commentaar van de enige persoon. Nee, man. Ik ben ik nog vrienden geweest, nee? Nee. Nee? Nee? Bij een bestje heb je hard proberen met ons uit te halen. Wat was uw bestje Dat was um, Adaptive Streaming framework maken. Dat is het, de volledige pipeline eigenlijk maken aan de kant voor het... De vakantiewerk toe? Nee, 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 nee. Um, Ken je Bandwidth nog? Zegt u dat? Die naam? Dat was een echt... Ja, 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 ja. <laughs> Ik geloof dat jij de vraag hebt gesteld van hoe je economische winst uittrekken. Oh, goede vraag. Ik stel ze nu ook aan mijn bed, je studenten, maar. Los daarvan. 
Ja, ik heb dus dat is dus iets dat ik absoluut niet ga doen. Hè. <laughs> Dat moet iemand zijn, want dat is voor een eenmalig iets in uw carrière. <laughs> ja. Ik weet niet of dat Jori al aanwezig is, maar die heeft echt die twee doctoraten niet. Ik denk het niet. Oh. Oh. Komt er zelfs nog iemand van Google kijken ook nog? Oh, oh. <laughs> ja, Steven, ja, nog een paar minuten. Hoor. Stip 6 hebben ze mij gezegd. Kijk, ik wil niet altijd mee. Ja. <laughs> uh, sinds gisteren uh, misschien niet meer. Hoor. Ik weet niet of het systeem ook goed genoeg werkt om alles op te nemen. Ja, jawel, je... ik voel je staat ook. Ja. <laughs> ja, ik zit bij gewoon een lachen, denk ik. Ja. We kijken toe over twee jaar, kun je in de zaal zitten en kun je ook aan mijn tand doen. Oef, man, man toch. Misschien de jullie, hè? Ik wou het juist zeggen, ik ga, ik ga Peter en Wim lobbyen totdat ik in uw jury ben. <laughs> Shit. Ja, misschien moet ik dan best ook wel stoppen op deze moment. <laughs> het publiek mag straks ook vragen staan. Ah, nou. Hebben ze een small window of opportunity? Ja. De eerste vraag. En waarom zo de focus op Jason? <laughs> Dat maar eens in, daar heb ik een antwoord op. <laughs> mm. um, zal ik preventief zelfs de audio uitzetten of wat wil je? Ik ga die storen. Hè. Oh, die audio pas nodig uh, bij de vragen. Het is dat, ja. Plus. En ik denk toch dat het Mr. TV komt momenteel. Dat is het probleem. En dat is. Als je die hier op te zetten, dan heb ik geen vragen om te beantwoorden, dus dat is ook goed. Ja, dat is ook een optie. Vragen van de jury, niemand die het echt laten. Alles duidelijk. Boek en zegen, digitaal presenteren. Ah, oeps, het internet is uitgevallen. Oei, oei, oei. Dat is niet de virus. Ja, ik denk niet dat ik dat... Ja, ik kan de audio gewoon matig uitzetten. Maar laat me opstaan, voor eens maar. Maar dus Bram, zoals gezegd, binnen vijf minuten hit je de kill button op Google Services en dan uh, laat je die een uur kunnen uitstaan en dan is alles goed. Hm. Goed. We hebben verbinding met, het, met de jury en met het publiek. Oh, ik denk zo. <coughs> Even zien. Ja, ik zie ze er tussen staan. Dus met de tv. Ik heb heel zeker een Bram gezegd dat hij op een strategisch moment moet. Ik kan toen mijn man die afzetten. Als de vragen van de jury beginnen, ongeveer. Goed, 
dan uh, ik hoop dat iedereen uh, die remote volgt mij kan verstaan. Even checken. Ja, dit oké. Okay. Wel, dan heet ik iedereen hartelijk welkom op de uh, publieke verdediging van het uh, doctoraat van Robin Marx. Uh, het uh, doctoraat zal beoordeeld worden door een jury uh, die is uh, samengesteld als volgt. Uh, die bestaat uit uh, dokter Lars Egert van NetApp in Finland, uh, professor Oliver Holveld van de Technische Universiteit Brandenburg in Duitsland. Uh, Dr. Balakrishnan Gandrasekaran van het Max Planck Instituut voor Informatiek, ook in Duitsland. Professor Olivier Bonaventure van de Universiteit Catholique de Louvain. En dan verder een aantal mensen uit het eigen huis. Professor Jori Liesenborgs, uh, professor Wim Lamot, co-promotor. Uh, professor Peter Klaks, promotor. En ikzelf ben uh, Mark Gijsens en ik ga proberen uh, in deze eigenaardige setting die de coronamaatregelen toch met zich meebrengen, dat doctoraat ook zo goed mogelijk in goede banen uh, te leiden. Goed, uh, dan stel ik voor dat we uh, meteen uh, beginnen en dan zou ik graag... Uh, Robin willen vragen in ongeveer 40 à 45 minuten uw werk aan ons te willen voorstellen, alsjeblieft. All right, hello everyone and welcome to my PhD thesis defense. And as you all might have heard, the best defense is a good offense. And I happen to know a little bit about defending and attacking because for the past six years, I have been training historical European martial arts, in particular, longsword fencing. And so for a while, my dream for today has been to come to you here dressed in my battle gear in order to intimidate the jury so that they would make the right decision at the end. Now, of course, because of COVID, most of the jury members are sitting at home and I decided to go for a light version of this plan. Uh, I've just brought one of my swords today to use as a pointer during the presentation. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, the sport had originated in the medieval times, a time of knights. And every self-respecting knight has a mission, a noble quest. For example, for King Arthur, his quest was to find the Holy Grail. Now, for the past four years, my Holy Grail has been something called web performance. Meaning that I've researched how we can make websites load faster. This is important because, as it turns out, all of you are impatient little buggers. At least, according to Google. They say that half of you won't even wait three seconds for a page to load. This, in turn, affects other websites like Amazon because they lose money because you don't even stick around long enough to buy some of their products. That's bad for the companies, but it gets worse, as we can see in this map of the world, which shows the average internet speeds where red is quite bad. And in these regions, you typically also have worse hardware, slower smartphones. And so for a lot of people, there is little difference between a website that is slow to load and one that is too slow to load to be practically usable. And so these people often have challenges accessing important educational, medical, legal information in a timely manner. So making pages faster is not just good for the big companies, but for a lot of people worldwide. Now to understand how we can improve this, well, we first need to understand how the web page is loaded. And for this, during the presentation, I'm going to use my second hobby as a metaphor, which is eating food. As you can tell, I, I do that a little bit too much. And one of my favorite things to eat is cake. And as you all know, if you want to bake a cake, you typically need a couple of ingredients, which if you combine them correctly, you get a delicious end result. And the same is true for a web page, 
For example, if this is our final web page, then we will start with the first ingredient, which is called an HTML document. And as you can see, this document mainly contains the text of the web page, and it also has links to all the other ingredients that we need. So the first ingredient is kind of like the rest of the recipe. The second file we might need is a CSS style sheet. As you can see, this adds a bit of color to the page and also positions all the elements. Now look at the text on the page because that's going to change when we load the next file, which is a font, which makes everything look a bit more distinguished for this occasion. Now the next file makes everything look a lot cooler, which is the image. And the final file, you won't see it visually on the website. This is something called JavaScript, which is some programming code that executes every time you go to this web page. Now, if you want to make a cake, you go to the store and you buy the ingredients. Exactly the same for a web page. So what, for example, companies like Amazon do is they're going to buy a computer. They're going to put that computer somewhere, let's say, in the United States. They're going to put the files that we need on the computer. What then happens if you go to Amazon.com is that you're going to use a piece of software called the browser, Google Chrome or Apple Safari. And that is going to ask the document from the server, which is going to send it back over the internet. And then you know you need other files like the CSS style sheet and so on and so forth. This is basically how a website is loaded. But it's actually, of course, a bit more complicated than that. First of all, this all doesn't happen instantly. Because, of course, like I said, the server is in the United States, which is quite far away. And so one time up and down can take about 200 milliseconds. The second thing that makes this more complicated is that we typically don't uh, send this file all at once. No, what we're going to do is we're going to chop it up into all kinds of little pieces. And we're going to send each of these individually in what we call network packets. As we can see, the larger the file is, the more pieces we need, the more packets you're going to need on the network, and it's going to take longer for the page to load. It gets much worse because the internet sometimes has a habit of actually losing some of these packets in transit. And so what we need then is another mechanism from the browser that says, well, I've received packet one, two, and five, but not three and four. And then we need another thing at the server that says, okay, but I'm just going to take new copies of three and four and send that back to you. And so you can imagine this gets quite complex quite fast. And this is just one of 10 to maybe 20 different things happening all at the same time. The other thing is that you see that we have to have a couple of ups and downs already. And though each of the ups and downs only takes about 20, uh, 200 milliseconds, if you need to do this 10 times, you will already have about two seconds of wait time which you'll start to notice. Another thing that you might see is that we're not only sending the data. We're also sending extra things. For example, the request for the initial document. We somehow need to tag all of the little pieces with packet numbers. And we need this special acknowledgement message as well. And so in the food analogy, we're not just sending the eggs. We're also sending the packaging that is around it. And on the packaging is a little bit of extra information about what is inside. Now, the final thing we notice from this image is that there are typically different companies that make the browser and the server. It's different software running on both things. And so to enable them to correctly communicate with each other, somehow these companies, they need to agree on how exactly that should happen. They need to have like a common set of rules. And this is what we typically call a network protocol. This is a set of rules, and if everybody follows these, if everybody implements the same protocol, then they can indeed communicate over the internet. Now, these protocols, they don't just spring up out of holes in the ground, no. They're actually designed and developed by a group of experts. For the protocols that I've looked at in my thesis, this is done by the IETF the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is a loose organization where people from big companies like Google, Apple, Facebook, as well as, for example, academic researchers like myself, we come together about three times a year <coughs> to discuss these protocols and 
if we need to change them or if we maybe need to invent some new ones for use in the future. And if we can reach an agreement on what that should look like, then we will write what is called an RFC, an internet standard document, describing what the protocol should do. And so companies, they only need to, in theory, read these documents, implement them as described, and then they can interact with software from all the other companies in the world. So, so much for the introduction. Let's summarize that a little bit. Our goal is to improve web performance. You can do that in several ways, but the way that we did it is look at how things are being sent over the internet. And what defines how this is done? Well, these are these protocols and what they are doing. Now, I've mainly focused on two different protocols during my PhD, which is HTTP, which is something most of you probably already have seen, and something called TCP. These protocols have been around for a long time, since the 80s and even the 90s, and they've been updated a little bit, but not really. Until seven or eight years ago, suddenly a rapid evolution started in these protocols. And in the past five years, we've had not one, but two new versions of HTTP2, and even a new uh, alternative for TCP, which is called the Quick Protocol. Now, as you might guess, this period of evolution nicely overlaps with my PhD. And of course, um, what I've done in this first half of my PhD then, is I've looked at how we can go from HTTP1 to HTTP2, and how we can improve web performance with that. And in the second half, I've actually been able to contribute to the uh, creation of these new protocols and also make sure that they are uh, nice and fast on the web. And this is what the rest of the presentation is going to be about, starting, of course, with the first half on HTTP2. Now, back in 2015, HTTP2 was all the rage. All of the YouTube videos and the blog posts, they were all talking about how fast it was, as you can see here, for example, Google claiming even 55% faster page loads. The problem is that when I myself started testing this, even very early on, I noticed that in some cases, it was actually exactly the opposite. It was much, much slower. Now, mostly, if you have this situation where one of the biggest companies in the world says one thing, and a starting PhD student says, the opposite, there's typically only one logical explanation, right? The problem exists between the keyboard and the chair. <laughs> however, <coughs> however, there are other potential reasons for this to happen. For example, it could be that there are problems with the protocol itself. It's quite unlikely, but it could be. Much more likely is it that it's just some bugs in the implementations. After all, back then, HTTP2 was really, really new, and we software developers are not very good at our jobs, and so most software has a little bit of bugs. Now, we didn't know which of these three options it was, so we wanted to test this. This is where the research begins. Um, but I didn't really have enough experience then to know where to start looking. And so I decided to just look at everything at the same time. I was going to look at all the protocols, Two different browsers, different servers, different networks, everything. Now, if I would have had to do this manually, I would probably still be clicking away on my laptop right now. So what we decided to do is automate this process in a framework that we called Speeder. Imagine this is just a bunch of computers automatically loading web pages and storing the results in a database. What we can then do is write this kind of nice visualization that immediately shows some trends. For example, we can see here with the arrow is that in some cases, HTTP2, which is the green, is indeed sometimes much slower than HTTP1. But on the right side here, we can also see that there are some cases in which it's indeed much, much faster. And so using this setup over the course of about one and a half years, we were able to look at almost all of the different aspects of these protocols. I don't really have time to go over all of this today, lucky for you, but most of our research came to the same conclusions. And so I can just take one of these features to explain so you can understand it. And the one I'm going to use is called 
prioritization. And I'm again going to use food as a metaphor here. So imagine what we're doing here is we're eating this nice, nutritious meal. Now over HTTP 1, what you would be doing for this meal is eating everything at the exact same time. This is anatomically impossible because we would need four mouths in our face to do this. But even if it were possible, this wouldn't be a very good idea because we would still only have one throat and one stomach. And if you would eat too much of this at the same time, some of it might eventually, you know, come back up. And this is actually something, one of the big problems with HTTP 1, is that it can end up overloading the network, causing things like the packet loss that we discussed previously. This is one of the reasons why HTTP 2 says, no, we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to do, uh, we're just going to eat everything one piece, one thing at a time. This then begs the question, in what order are we going to eat our different things? Because I don't know if you've noticed this, but I know that people tend to eat meals in slightly different ways. For example, I, myself, I would probably start with the broccoli because I don't really like it. I want to get it out of the way as fast as I can so that I can later finish strong with my delicious fries. Now my fiance, she thinks that's stupid. She says by then the fries are all cold and soggy. And so she eats them first. And you can see in my household, we often have a lot of leftover broccoli. Now my sister, she does something else entirely. She will devour something in its entirety before moving on to her next victim. It's easy to see why she decided to become a lawyer. Now finally, my dad, he grew up in the 60s and the 70s and he doesn't care anymore. He just goes around the plate picking things up as they come up. Now for eating a meal, that doesn't really matter. It's personal preference. But of course, when loading a web page, which of these options you choose can have a big impact. Let's, for example, imagine on my web page, if we would load the CSS tiles to last, that would mean that for a very long time, we would be looking at this ugly white page without any makeup, right? And the thing is, most websites are very different from each other. These websites, they load completely different files. Um, and so they also need probably different logic to determine in which order they should be loaded. And so to support this, this diversity of websites, we need a very flexible system to do this. And so HTTP2, they call this the prioritization system. And for that, they use what is called a tree. Sounds complex maybe, but it's easy enough. If this is, for example, one of the trees, what this means is that we want to eat the peas and carrots first. And when all of them are done, then we want to eat our nice hamburger. Also, just that. And what we want to do then is start working on the broccoli and the fries. But for each piece of broccoli that we eat, we want to eat two fries. And you can see this system is quite powerful indeed. You can imagine other types of trees being made with that, which all lead to slightly different behaviors in how the web page is loaded. And this is again where we as researchers start to ask questions. Well, which tree is the best for which website? Which one of these should we be using? Because that's not something that the HTTP2 specification actually says. And this is one of my first papers that I was able to do with my amazing colleague Martin and the help from a great student called Dan, um, where we started looking at how is this actually used in practice. And we found some weird things. For example, as you can see here, it turns out that the browsers, they don't actually really use this flexibility at all. They all just choose one tree form and use that for all the different web pages. What's even weirder is that they don't seem to agree on which of these forms is actually best. So they all do quite different things. This gives us additional questions, right? Which of these is best? Why are they using different things? And maybe can we improve um, this behavior by ourselves? And so we used our, our frameworks and all to measure all of this, getting a nice page, a nice table full of interesting numbers, which of course I'm not going to discuss today. That would be too boring. Luckily, we have one graph that kind of nicely summarizes what we can learn from this. 
What you can see here is each of these different lines is, is one of the ways, uh, one of these trees, one of the ways that a website can be downloaded. And the lines in the middle there, you can see they're all very similar. They're all almost equally the same in terms of speed. And these are what is being done by Chrome and Firefox and similar schemes that we ourselves propose. What we can see, however, is that there are two that are very, very different. And the first one here on top, that turned out to be HTTP 1. So the uh, older version of the protocol was actually much faster than the newer one in these tests. We can also see that there is one on the bottom here, which is Microsoft's Edge browser. Now, to understand why that is happening, it's relatively easy if I tell you that what Chrome is doing is how my sister eats and what Edge is doing is how my dad eats. Now you see, if you want to use an ingredient on a web page, for most of them, you need to download them in full. You need to have eaten all of it to actually be able to use it. And you can see the way that my sister eats works perfectly well for that. Everything is downloaded as soon as it possibly can. Well, what my dad is doing, he is mixing parts of all of the ingredients, eventually delaying all of them in turn. And this can have some very, very serious... Um, <coughs> is the presentation not shared? Yes, it is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and this can have some very serious consequences in terms of how this web page loads. This can be clearly seen in the next video, where we show uh, from our colleagues at Cloudflare, where you can see that Chrome indeed starts loading first, Firefox not far behind, Safari also still pretty fast, but now we have to wait 10 seconds before Microsoft Edge catches up. And this is weird, right? Why would a big company like Microsoft choose such a bad, bad scheme? The answer it is as simple as it is stupid. It's because that is basically what is recommended in the HTTP2 specification. This actually says if you don't do anything, if you don't want to implement anything special, you should just fall back to this option, which turns out to be not so very good. The question is, why is this in the specification? It turns out that this prioritization feature was actually added quite late in the work on HTTP2. And they didn't really have enough time to properly test this on all kinds of different web pages. What else is that I think they kind of underestimated how bad this could be for some web pages. And I also think that they didn't really actually think people would use the default that they would try to implement something better. Now, let's be honest, it's not that big of a problem, right? Because who uses Microsoft browsers anyway? The problem is it's not just the browsers that had problems with this system. About a year after our work, some other people, they looked at what the servers were doing, so the other side of the equation, and they found that very few servers actually did this correctly. So even if you're using a good browser like Chrome, you would still end up loading pages slower than could because the server wasn't properly working along. And earlier this year, I actually wanted to go back and see if things had changed by now, and Sadly, no. I looked at three of the most popular web servers that we have. They serve billions of pages on the internet today, and none of them correctly implement this, even in 2020. And so from this, we can take some general conclusions about HTTP2, which is that it's rarely much faster than H1. Typically, it's about as fast or maybe a little bit faster. But there are some very important cases in which it's actually much, much slower. And the root cause of that is not one of these, but both combined. There are both problems in the HTTP2 specification, for example, the bad default, and problems with the implementations themselves. And again, this is not just something that we get from prioritization. Many other systems in HTTP2 have turned out not to work very well in practice. I think this is partly because this protocol is so complex. It has a lot of moving parts, and even for the experts designing this, it's sometimes difficult to estimate how this will all turn out in practice. And this got me worried, because now we're about halfway through my PhD, and as I said, 
what they were doing then, they were starting work on new protocols, on HTTP 3. This is, of course, partly because there were so many problems with HTTP 2. But the thing that had me worried is that even then it was very clear that these new protocols were going to be even more complex than HTTP 2, a lot more complex. And so I could envision similar problems happening with the new protocols over time. And our beamer has gone away. Is my laptop? No, no. I'm sorry for the delay. No? <laughs> Is it still visible on the stream? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I can imagine everybody can just watch there, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, where was I? Okay. So these new protocols are actually much more complex, and we were afraid that they would have similar problems. And so the second part of our PhD has been about trying to prevent these problems from happening again with the new protocols. And the way that we've done that is mostly by trying to make some of this complexity easier to understand, easier to uh, figure out what exactly is happening and to see if there are any problems. Now, we've come about at the halfway point of the presentation and I've noticed something, which is that I'm the one doing all the hard work here. And I don't think that's very fair. So what I propose to do is I'm going to let you guys do a little bit as well. I've prepared a challenge, a little game. And the game is called Guess the Dish. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a long list of ingredients on the screen. And I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to guess which dish you can make with these ingredients. It's just one dish. And if you've guessed it, you don't need to shout it or you don't need to put it in the chat. It's just for you. But try to guess the dish as soon as you can when you see the ingredients. Clear? All right. Ready, set, go. <laughs> All right, I think most people here on this end have guessed it by now because the dish is, of course, paella, the famous Spanish dish. Now, what I think happened is that you all started reading from the top and then you saw the sausage and the chicken and you thought, okay, this is going to be something with meat. And then you were very surprised when you saw the seafood and then maybe at the end you saw the saffron and the rice and you thought, okay, this might be indeed paella. The point is that this took a little bit of time, right? And I'm pretty sure that if I had just shown you the image without the ingredients, within one or two seconds, most of you would have been, well, that's paella, obviously. And even people that don't know the dish, they would have been able to say, well, it's obviously got some rice and some mussels and some green peas for color, right? So the point I'm trying to make is something that we all know is that a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is the insight uh, behind basically our work in trying to make the new protocols a, bit, a, little bit, a little bit less complex. Because what we have done is gone from what used to be a very textual process of developing and debugging the protocols to making it a lot more visual and interactive. Now to understand why we need text for these protocols, I need to explain a little bit to you about how programmers work. Programmers, they have to make software in what is called a programming language, which is something that you can see here. Um, <coughs> and I'm being... No, just continue. <laughs> I'm not here. Oh, there we go. Very right. nice. Right. Now it's back here as well. Um, so programmers uh, have to write software in programming languages. And these protocols, the network protocols, they are also just software. I have a bit of, of a confession to make because we programmers, we're actually pretty bad at our jobs. We often make a lot of mistakes. Many programs have bugs. We all know this. Now, we're quite aware of this. And one of the ways that we try to prevent this from happening is what you can see here is by adding some logging statements to our code. 
So everything that happens, we add a little bit of text describing what exactly happened, and we then print that to the screen, um, and we get a nice overview of the interactions. Now, even for relatively simple page loads, this would quickly become thousands or even tens of thousands of lines of text, which would take quite a while to analyze. Additionally, just like with the paella, we didn't know it was paella. Well, we don't always know if there is actually a problem in uh, one of these logs. And even if we do know there's a problem, it's often not clear where exactly in the logs it is. And so <laughs> the way that we've tried to solve this is um, by a project that is called QVIS, Quick Visualization, which I started two years ago with two great students called Jonas and Tom. Um, and QVIS is a set of tools that visualizes these protocols and their behavior. The first tool is what you can see here and also on the next slide. It's called the sequence diagram. This is what we saw before in the presentation. It just shows the packets going over the network when there was packet loss. In this case also, sometimes packets, they get reordered on the network, which is visible here using the crossed lines. This is just one of the tools. The second one is called a congestion graph. Now I could try to explain to you what we're seeing here, but the nice thing is that I think that's not actually even necessary. I think this is intuitive enough that all of you can become protocol debugging experts in the next minute. Because the only things that you need to know is two rules. The first one is that the pink line should never touch the blue line. The second rule is the opposite, that the purple line should always be as close as possible to the yellow. Those are the two main rules. And if those are okay, then it's relatively sure that this trace does not contain a problem. Now that you know this, and I'll show you the next picture, all of you will be able to say there is some seriously bad things going on here because the pink is always touching the blue and the yellow almost never reaches the purple. And even in traces where it's not constantly going wrong, there's just one area where there's a problem, it's very easy for everyone to see where exactly that might be and so to start looking into that particular area. And as I said, this is just one screenshot but it represents a log file of thousands of lines of code, which we can see in one instant what exactly was happening there. The next tool that we have deals with what I've explained before, the fact that we're also sending packaging, not just the eggs. Now in practice, we don't just use one protocol, we actually use several together, each of which needs their own packaging. And just as in real life, if you try to put these things into bigger and bigger boxes, there's always going to be a little bit of loss, a little bit of room space left over. It's a little bit inefficient. And so to help determine this inefficiency, the next tool shows that as white space in the tool. So the more white that you have here, the worse it is. And we can see there are some areas here where everything is nicely packed together, nice and cozy, but there are obviously some cases where we need to look at how exactly uh, this could be made more efficient. The second thing that this allows us to do is to see if things with different colors are being packed together, which depending on the ingredient might or might not be what you actually want. The final tool I wanted to show you has to do with the prioritization stuff that I talked about earlier. We actually made some tools as well when we were doing HTTP2 work. This is one of them. And this really helped us to assess what these trees look like in practice, but it was difficult for this, from this to actually see how exactly data was put on the network. And so what we did this time around is make a new visualization that just gives a, a new color to each of the ingredients, and that makes it much simpler to see how exactly these ingredients are being sent on the network. And I could keep going, but I think that the basic message I'm trying to convey here is pretty clear. Um, and of course also that this type of tool makes it much, much faster than using the text-based representation to find problems with these protocols. Now there's one thing I haven't talked about is that we are doing data visualization here, but where do we get the data? 
And people that are not programmers, they might think, well, that's quite simple. You just use this file, you give it to the computer, and it generates the nice images, right? However, that's not exactly how programming works. Programmers, we have to start looking for patterns in the data that we can use. So for example, if this would be the input, we would see, okay, it's always first the amount, then there is space, and then there is a type of the ingredient. <coughs> and that way we can write code to do that, which works fine until some idiot, of course, starts making recipes that look like this. Suddenly, all of our code breaks and nothing works anymore. We could, of course, write new code that deals with this, but you can keep on doing this. And this is actually what happened with the quick implementations. Everyone was using a different format. And that almost drove one of my bachelor students crazy trying to keep up with that. And the proper way of dealing with this, or one of the ways, is to actually do something like this. Where for each of the fields, we will actually explicitly say what is contained in the field. And so it doesn't really matter what the order is, you can always know exactly what data you're looking at. Now this is something that is not always done properly in program. As I said, most quick implementations didn't do this. And so we basically had to invent this type of format ourselves for quick in HTTP3, which is what became our QLog project. And QLog, you can see this basically as a long list of all the things that can happen in these protocols, and then a definition of how they should be logged in a textual form. And what it ends up looking like is a little bit like this. But there is a bit of a downside to this, of course. This, has, uh, this, this is a little bit of an extra work for the people making the protocols. They have to uh, understand the format and make sure it's all correct. Luckily, QLog has other benefits, mainly in the area of privacy. There are other methods that we can use to store our data. The problem is that due to the way that these protocols work, we can often not separate the actual data, the eggs, from the packaging, which is what the protocols are doing. And to interpret these protocols and make visualizations, what we actually need is just the packaging. We don't need the eggs. The problem is, I've told you that the eggs, they are the files that you send on the network, but the eggs are also your password and also your personal messages on Facebook. And so with QLog, we can simply choose to not log that and only keep the things that we need for the visualizations, making everything better, more privacy uh, secure for the end user. And it turns out that this combination of having nice tools and good privacy is something that people generally like. And I'm very happy to say that today, over 70% of all quick implementations actually implements QLog. And even more people are using our QVis tools to uh, debug and analyze what their implementations are doing. This includes some of the biggest companies in the world, main among them Facebook, because Facebook, they were like, we're not going to wait for everyone else to finish. We're already going to start using these protocols today. And so if you're using one of the Facebook apps, there's a high chance that in the background, you're already using Quick and HTTP3 today. And there's also a high chance that what, you're, uh, what the interaction is doing is logged in our QLog format on the Facebook servers, and that they will then use QVis to analyze them if there's something going wrong. Now, to be honest, it's incredibly humbling for me as a PhD student to see that this project has been used so well uh, by so many people. But sadly, I can't take all the credit for this. As I said, I've had some terrific collaborators in the past, many here at the university, but also at the IETF itself. Two years ago, I started going to these meetings. <coughs> and this is one of my favorite pictures from them. I'm there, of course, in the middle in the blue, and I'm explaining one of my new visualizations. And the people around me are actually some of the smartest people in the world working, on, uh, working with some of the biggest internet companies in the world. And because of this, they were interested in what we were doing. They were able to give us feedback on how to make this even better. And because we were able to make things better, more people were interested in using it. 
leading to us getting even more feedback. And so over the course of these two years, this has been a constant cycle. And what we have ended up with now, I think, is a, is a set of products, projects that everybody generally kind of likes. And if you know me, you know I don't tend to, uh, to brag, but I thought, you know, if I can brag a little today, then why can't I? And the nice thing is that uh, recently it's, uh, we're even having discussions about whether QLog should be adopted as an official ITF standard, so maybe it will someday become an actual internet standard as well. Now it's very nice that other people are using our stuff, but what is even nicer is that we've been, been, been able to use it to do our own research. For example, as you can imagine, when they were making HTTP3, the question came up if we shouldn't just remove this system altogether because it was too complex and nobody was using it. The question is, replace it with what? And if we define a replacement, is that still going to work uh, properly? Won't we have the same problems as we had before? That, of course, we thought, this looks like a job for me. And so, with the help of three fantastic students, Kevin, um, Tom and Sven, we were actually able to make our own quick and HTTP3 implementations from scratch. We were then able to use these to re-implement the HTTP2 schemes that we saw before on top, and also a couple of the new proposals, some of which are on, to see how they compare. And you can see by using these new tools, it becomes much easier to determine how well all of these things work. Because here we're looking at the most important ingredients for a web page, which are the one with the black bars on the bottom. And it should be as much to the left as possible. And you can see here that even for some of the newer uh, approaches, they actually work quite a bit better than the older ones. And so partly because of our research, the ITF indeed decided to try and make a new simpler scheme. And it's very nice that we were allowed to be part of the team that designed this new scheme. And what we eventually came up with looks a bit like this. Every ingredient is just given a single number. And things with lower numbers are sent for first before things with higher numbers, which is indeed nice and simple. Everybody should be able to make that work. The second aspect of this is that for each ingredient, you can say whether it should always be eaten by itself completely or if it can be chopped up into pieces and uh, mixed with other ingredients. Now, crucially, the default behavior for this is, of course, the first, which is the exact opposite of the default in HTTP2. So it's very nice, I think, that we have been able to do the full cycle here. We have been able to discover this problem in HTTP2 originally, and then we were able to play a small part in making sure that this uh, system became better for the new protocol. The second thing that we were able to research is many different quick implementations. This is a paper that we did this year with the incredible Lioris. Um, and if you remember what I told you before is that it took us about a year and a half to analyze about six different HTTP2 implementations. Well, now, with QLog and QVis, we were able to compare 15 quick implementations, of which this only shows 10, by the way, I, I still count, um, but 15 different implementations, which only took us about five to six months. And again, the, the details of our findings are not really important here. The main, uh, the main thing that we found is that these implementations are actually still pretty much all quite different. Some of this is due to some bugs, which we found during our research, which are uh, hopefully now fixed. Um, but some of this is because some of these uh, implementers actually consciously made different choices. And I might think, well, Robin, this shows that you have failed because we, we still have different implementation behaviors, the same thing we had with HTTP2. The big difference is that for H2, we discovered this two, three, four years after the protocol was done and actually broadly deployed on the internet. Well, now we know about this upfront before people start using it at scale. 
And we can much more easily say to them, well, depending on your use case, you should use this implementation or the other one, or at least make sure they understand what exactly the differences are and why. This is especially important for our fellow researchers because they, when they do protocol research, they typically only look at one or two implementations. And so I think we've shown that you need to consider about five to six to, for example, be able to make good conclusions about what a protocol can or cannot do. Now, as I said, this was the last paper that we did earlier this year. And so it's kind of time um, that I wrap this up. Now, have I been able to improve this fantastically for everybody in the world? No. I don't think any one single PhD can do that in four years. What I have done is have done a deep dive into one of the aspects that help determine how fast these pages load, the network protocols. Doing that, we've been able to find quite a few problems and bugs in the protocols themselves and their implementations. We were then also able to shift that around to be a bit, a bit more proactive and try to prevent these problems from happening again with the new protocols that were under development. And I think with our tools and our approach, we've made it possible for other people, people smarter than me, to use these new protocols in the next five to 10 years to indeed improve web performance, not just for Google and Amazon, but hopefully for many more people all around the world. <coughs> And with that, we've reached the end of this presentation, but of course, not the end of the PhD, because there is one final obstacle that I still need to conquer, which is my jury. Now, you might not know this, but typically what happens now is that the jury will start asking me a couple of questions. And they're typically quite sneaky about this. They're gonna start off easy with questions that everybody knows the answer to. <laughs> Their goal is to make me relaxed, to make me think, oh, it's good, you know, Robin, relax, slow down, you've got this. And at that exact time, they will go in for the kill. They will ask a very difficult question to which I have absolutely no answer. So you can see that this process is typically not very much fun for the PhD student. And let's be honest, also often quite a bit boring for the audience. And the other day I was talking about this with my promoter, my professor, Peter, and he agreed. He said, it's true, maybe for you, Robin, we can do something a bit more dynamic, a bit more matching the team of the presentation. And so what we decided is that my final test for my PhD is going to be a live sword duel to the death between me and him. <laughs> and if I'm able to survive, I will get my, my doctorate. And so, as we discussed, Peter, I've actually brought... Oh, that's very good. I've brought a second sword for you to use. And uh, while Peter is getting ready uh, for the fight, um, I would like to find, end with thanking all of you so very nice that you were here to support me. I hope it was a bit interesting, maybe a bit entertaining even. Um, it's very heartwarming to me that you all showed up in such big numbers to, to support me today. So again, thank you and uh, enjoy the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we start with the boring questions? Again? Yes. <laughs> Please let's do that. Um, dus de jury gaat nu ook tot het snelle van vragen. En uh, gezien er ook niet meer dan stalige juryleden zijn, gaan we dat doen in het Engels. Because several members of the committee are non Dutch speaking. We, of course, will do the questions also in English. And I would like to ask uh, Dr. Eggert to open the questioning. The floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Lars. OK, great. Um, so I guess my first question has to be, what is your name? 
<laughs> My name is Robin Marx. You set yourself up for that one. So, uh, <laughs> well done, Robin. Um, so, I'd like to chat a little bit about um, um, Quick. Right, you talked about in H two that you found uh, areas like uh, server push and priorities that were like added very late and therefore quite untested. Um, do you see anything in Quick at the moment that that would you know fall in that same category that that we added late and it's it's untested and we might in three or four years you know have a PhD explain to us why this was all wrong? Uh -huh. Yes, connection migration. <laughs> Not because it was added late, but as you know, um, as, as the discussion about multipath recently shows that it's, it's implemented, but it's relatively untested on the actual internet, right? And so they don't, want, they don't even want to start thinking about multipath before we have more experience with connection migration. Um, and this is also, because of that, one of the things that is actually not yet in QLog because I was waiting for it to actually finish to settle down to know what we were what we were actually going to do with that. So if there's one thing I, I would say is connection migration. I would probably agree with you. And, and you sort of foreshadowed my next question, which was like thinking about uh, QLog and QVis especially, right? How would you visualize something like that, a connection migration event um, or a server preferred address migration? Yeah. So. Um, QLog, uh, QVis actually already kind of supports loading more than two files. So what you can do is, is uh, load one trace for the initial connection, and then if you change um, to a new, con uh, if you change the connection, you, <laughs> sorry, if you migrate the connection to, uh, for example, new connection ID, you might either use the same file or switch to a different file loading these. And so what you would have in the sequence diagram, for example, is three different lines where you first have all the traffic from line one to two, and then they switch to line one to three, for example, yeah. that would be possible. Another way of doing it, which is what uh, the, the, the multipath guys from UC Louvain have done, they use different colors for their arrows indicating on which paths uh, all the traffic was being sent. So you would, you would uh, separate it out into multiple files rather than adding path or IP address information to the queue lock? Well, that doesn't really matter. Um, because in the tools, you can decide either to use different files or you can just separate them out based on the IP address. But also, what we're using in QLog is called the group ID, which I think what, what Quant is using, right, to be able to log all the connections in one file. So what we can do in QVis is split everything up uh, by use of the, of the group ID and then make separate lines for each group ID. Mm. And because most implementations use the quick connection ID for the group ID and that typically changes for connection migration, that would actually, um, <laughs> I don't want to say it works today, <laughs> um, but it probably would be quite easy to add. Right. Um, the other thing, you are, so I haven't seen what the Levant people have done in terms of visualizing multipath extension, but that was sort of a, a big thing in my mind when I saw the Cubis, uh, um graphs, because you have potentially many of them now, if you have multiple uh, multipath quick um, and they're interrelated. Um, and, and how do you visualize that in a way that makes sense? Um, QLog and QVis um, borrow a lot from, from TCP trace and earlier tools that, for T that were done for TCP. We never really did something like that for multipath TCP either. Um, so it's not like there's something that, that we know uh, that works there. There's there one, there one paper from Lucy Levan that did do um, MP TCP trace. Um, how, what, how did they visualize it or how would you visualize something like that? Sort of intuitively more clear. Yeah, Is that yeah. the whole thing, right? To, to, to give the developers some intuition about what's going on to the to the connections uh, that are active. Yeah, that's well, pretty much. I think the the, the answer that I just gave um, is that I would use um, separate lines or separate lanes. In, for example, the, the sequence diagram would use separate mm -hmm. lanes, um, and if you would want, you could split it out even more. That you would just have a separate pair of two lanes for each of the different paths next to each other. This is what uh, a different tool from UC Louvain has done. They just use a different column for each of the individual paths, and you just place the columns next to each other um, to be able to compare it like that. I think that's probably the easiest option for the sequence diagram. For the other diagrams, yeah, that's definitely um, uh, one of the problems. I also touch upon this a little bit in the text because we had that for the original versions of QVis. Those were all able to more easily compare different traces uh, on the same screen. We took that out for now because it wasn't really being used. And as you indicated, it's, it's quite difficult. So 
Um, I, I would need a bit more experimentation to know what, what a good visualization for that is, yeah. Right. Um, so, so moving on a little bit from from QLock and QVis, right? You um, you made us all protocol experts earlier on in your slide by explaining these simple rules about you know how the curves shouldn't touch or these curves should be close to each other, um, and and so one of the sort of um, I think future work that that could follow here is is pretty obvious, right? You you, you claimed or you, you you saw that Facebook is using this in production and generates billions of events, um, which probably means hundreds of millions of QLogs. Nobody can look at this anymore um, as a human, right? You would you would need to filter this and process them um, pretty aggressively, and and only give the very very small percentage uh, that that actually you know is, has known issues and severe issues to somebody who can can figure out based on the visualization what's going on. Have you any done any thoughts about how you could um, you know codify some of these simple rules uh, and have a computer uh, look at very many of these Q logs rather than a human? Yeah. Um, so, so the thing that Facebook does is they put up all the individual events in their relational database, and they can actually run queries over this. They can say, "Show me the traces with um, uh, over fifty percent packet loss," or, or "Show me the traces where there's a lot of this type events um, going on." Which is a nice thing that you can do with QLog. You can just look at individual event types rather than having to uh, interpret the data. Um, and as I Update, uh, did in my updated um, conclusion, I think, of the thesis, I think it's pretty easy to add a few relatively simple heuristics like that to, um, to these tools to not just uh, find the Q logs that you want, but even if you load the Q log that you think is bad, the tool can already show you or scroll to the correct point where it thinks there is a problem um, to make it even faster. Um, but that is indeed something that we, we haven't concretely looked at uh, on how to find the most interesting, the most salient traces uh, there. But I think that it kind of depends on what you're looking at. You will always have traces that have some weird behavior, right? So it depends on what exactly it is that you're researching at that point. Are you looking at the congestion control or are you looking at general packet loss in uh, a certain subset of the network and so on and so forth? Um, yeah, typically uh, you would sort of expect that, I mean, um... Tail latencies are measured pretty aggressively in in the web ecosystem anyway, right? So you would you could expect somebody like Facebook to take the you know top 99th percentile of, of their uh, tail latencies and and then run some automated analysis on them in order to to classify. So so this is probably another PhD or two. So so I I'm not saying this is something that you should have done, but it's it's sort of in my mind pretty obvious. I mean obviously for now the focus very much was on supporting the developers of this new protocol. And, and allowing them to uh, under, better understanding of, of what's going on with the code of the, they've been building, right? And, and as you, you know, had the quotes on your slide, I think everybody agrees that that is certainly an, has been achieved, right? And, and pe people really like to look at the graphs. But the next step, right? Because you started out when you early on, right? Building an automated tool for analyzing web performance, and and then you're moved to uh, building a, a tool that's very much for manual consumption. But so I, I wonder if you've given thought of going full circle and, and using now QLog, which is the data format that you've defined, to, to go back and have an automated tool that can analyze large volumes of this trace data, which we're going to have in a few months. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's definitely something I considered. But as you said, I only have ideas of how you might do that. We haven't actually implemented it. But the one thing I wanted to say there, because you, you asked the question in, in your review, and I, I, I thought about that a little bit, is I think you will always need um, the, the human components, or maybe not always, but typically, especially for the difficult problems that you will find, you will need the human component. Because the, the fast interpretation of these, of these visualizations and these tools, that is something that is unique to what we as humans can do, I think. So you can get some part of the way, maybe 95% with Automated, uh, automated systems, maybe even some machine learning where you have traces that you know are good versus things that are bad. Um, but you will always need to have, I think, a human in the loop, which, which is what I think, is, is, as I understand, is something that also happens for like TCP analysis on live networks today, right? Um, the case will be then to get only those traces to humans that the humans need to uh, evaluate manually, right? And that is indeed, um, going to be a big problem in, in the future. 
The thing is, I'm not really sure how this is done for TCP at this point. Um, for example, one of the things that, that Facebook told us is that um, they don't actually have systems that tracks TCP connections across uh, servers or data centers. So they don't actually have something that correlates client to pop, pop to uh, client to load balancer, load balancer to pop, and then back to the origin. They don't have that, which now they are experimenting with, with QLog. Um, and so I don't even know if that kind of system already exists for other protocols. Mm. I think for TCP, it's also very much manual. Um, at least, at least in in production at at many places, that there's a bunch of research on it. So, but I think I've sort of um, used my my 15 minutes. So thank you very much uh, for your talk, and uh, I'll be moving on, I guess. Uh, thank you, Dr. Egert. Um, we will now continue with uh, Professor Goldfeld, please. All right, so um, thanks for the very entertaining and fun to watch talk and presentation. Um, so I think I know Robin almost since the beginning of uh, uh, his PhD and have been closely following uh, all the contributions that you made, substantial contributions to a large set of protocols, so HTTP2, HTTP3, QUIC. Um, so it's also like um, I'm more than happy to at least be visually, uh, virtually here today. And I guess with the start that you've given, it's now time to ask about your favorite food. <laughs> um, I actually really enjoy seafood, um, especially shrimp, and especially if my mom makes them. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, OK, to actually get into the more serious part, let's, let's assume that there is a new place, a new seafood place opening around the corner. And, they're saying that, wow, we have this new place, and it's the best seafood that you will ever have. It's better than the one of your mother. And um, we want to figure out if that's really true. Um, so you have kind of come to the same conclusions that we made or that we did for HTTP server push. So that was mainly the PhD thesis of uh, Torsten, who is also on the call today, that you know sometimes this new place is not as good as it was advertised to be. However, like testing this out, as you have also um, experienced, is like really tedious. So we need to eat a lot of food because the browsers matters, the engineering of the website matters, the network matters. So it's a large state space that you actually need to explore. So um, to kind of follow up on Lars' question on the automation, like what's the what's the approach that we should that we should um, um, take to kind of understand the next protocol that um, is being defined by the ITF. Just buy a large rack of servers and do brute force, or how, how should we approach it? Oh, that's, that's a difficult question, Oliver. Um, as, as you say, I think there are just too many moving variables uh, in the full end-to-end -end stack. Yeah. Right? Most of the research looks at one slice of this. Uh, for example, for the prioritization, you have the, the Pilates research and the WPROF stuff. But that only look start, uh, looks on top of the protocols. And stuff like what I'm doing is, is application and transport. But then one of the things that I would have loved to do is, is go even deeper and look at how things work for Wi-Fi and, 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 uh, and now 5G, which is apparently giving some problems with, with buffer spaces and that kind of stuff. So, I've been trying to think about this. This is one of the things that I've been trying to see if I can do a paper on during a PhD and always failed. Um, if, if you can do this in one big model or, or one big setup, if you can model this somehow. And um, for example, Google has tried this for HTTP2 in their Lighthouse tools. So they don't actually run, uh, if, if they analyze the web page with Lighthouse, they don't actually run this over HTTP2. They kind of model what it might do and then what you might get out of it, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So um, to, to answer the question with that, I, I think it is indeed too difficult to make like a model or a simulation that covers everything of this. And I don't think we can do anything else than indeed do uh, the, the, the wide range of experimentation. And this is one of the things that frustrates me so much, as, as you've read in my chapter 15, um, is that it's very difficult for us as, as researchers to do this. We don't have access to all these different networks, all these different servers. The people that do are the Googles and the Facebooks. 
They don't allow us access to their data, they don't allow us to run experiments, and they typically don't run these experiments themselves, or at least not as much as we would like. Um, and this is, this is one of the things that I like about QLog, is that I hope that companies will start to make public some QLog datasets. Right? For example, Facebook has said that they are very interested in doing this. Once all the privacy sensitive information has been removed, we might get access to these millions of QLog files that we can then start analyzing as, um, as researchers. And so for new protocols, because I think that's what you asked for protocols in the future, I think we need to, we need to try and do that, the, the whole QLog and the debuggability stuff from the beginning. Now it was more like an afterthought because it was starting to be, become important. What I'm trying to push or hope to push at the ITF eventually is to say, if you have a new protocol, please think about this stuff upfront. Please generate this data while you're testing it. And so we can already look at some of the stuff as it's been going on. Hmm. One, well, since you already mentioned chapter 15, like one of the, one of the things that I was wondering about, and I would be curious to hear your opinion is that, um, what, what's your take on the current separation of like standardization work and academia? Because what happened, I mean, that was the story throughout a number of protocols was that the protocols were standardized and then the researchers were actually digging them apart and improving them. Um, is that the way how uh, we should continue to like organize this, this engineering work? Or with QLog and this implementation or the, these advancements that you pushed into, um, do you think we will get into an area where, because of the ease of data sharing, um, if you remove the privacy-centric part, that you know this will shift, this power will shift? I'm not sure if, if that's the thing that needs to shift. Um, but one of the things that I've had problems with as a researcher is, is should research be always practical? Should something always be immediately applicable? You know, um, especially at the start, I thought, yes, you can't do research if, it, if it's not useful, uh, even though many people in, in academia do that, or at least not something that's useful within now and, and 10 years. Um, the thing is that you indeed get something like this. People don't look at these protocols until it's basically already too late. I think what has to change there is mainly the academic incentives. As I've discovered, it's very difficult to get things published about these new protocols in, um, in flight, you know, because you don't have definitive results. And if you do get things published, it's typically not of the, of the highest quality that you might compare to more uh, advanced papers, right? And so many conferences and, and journals might not be as happy to accept that kind of work. And so I think we need to change the incentives there and to have things that actually encourage early research, early work. Um, and I think that QLog and things like QLog, you know, if, if we were able to standardize QLog for more different protocols, this might indeed help to incentivize that. Because as I've noticed at the beginning, a big problem starting to look at these protocols is it's a lot of effort. It's difficult. It costs you a lot of time. And I'm lazy, you know? and and. With this, you could probably tell something, well, you don't really need to set up your own stuff. Here's just a bunch of QLogs from Facebook. There you go. Uh, all you need to do is write, is use a JSON parser and you can start analyzing data, which is something most researchers are probably more interested in. And so I think that might eventually start helping, yes. Do you think we will ever get to a place where we have like more public data sets uh, to, uh, to kind of, analyze on or to have academics work on because that's like the other kind of direction that academics at least in our community currently talk a lot about is um, reproducibility and with a lot of the the work happening in the industry this is kind of uh, challenging so QLog might be one angle to to that if that really comes true that uh, more is being more data is being shared actually Exactly, and, and that's, like I said, one of the big problems. We don't have access to the bigger companies. And then even worse, even if, if we do make data sets and we do extensive experimentations, mm. very rarely do we make them public. Mm. Even this year, Sitcom and Conex, some papers do this quite well, but I think still the majority don't even release public artifacts. 
Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's again, something that the academic community should incentivize to do much more. We're already doing that, but I think it should be more of a requirement, right? If you want to publish in this conference, you better show us the data or, you know, you can't do that. But that has a really weird interaction with how practical things can be, right? Because if it's very practical, it's very usable, then you probably want to patent it or, you know, not share your exact methods with someone else. And you don't want to public, publicly uh, make, make public the data or, or the software that you use. And so um, it's, a, it's a very difficult, difficult balancing act. I, I completely agree. And um, so one of the things that I find remarkable in, in your thesis is that you actually went through all the burden of, you know, not only academic publishing, which is, you know, the expected outcome of a, of a PhD thesis, but then also going to uh, creating software artifacts that are usable by other people and that are actually getting de deployed. And then eventually pushing all of that into um, standardization. And so the quick working group is um, moving at quite a fast pace. Um, so that's quite a lot of effort and dedication that you have to put into this. So one of the things that I was wondering about is that we're now, you know, at the end of your PhD, but the next generation of PhD students is coming up. Um, so what would be kind of recommendations that you would give to younger PhD students in order to pick research problems and to have impact, lasting impact as, as you did? Well, uh, you always listen up. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, like I said, the question is, do you want, do you need to have impact with research? Right? Is, is that something you really want? Is, is that necessary? For some people, it is. For some, it isn't. For me, it's always been very important. I get a lot of my self-worth from what I hear from others. That's simply the way I work. And so that's why I've tried to make a lot of impact. If other people uh, are out there who want to do this, the, the only thing I could say, which I've said uh, three weeks ago in my presentation, um, is, is go to the IETF. Don't do this research on your own. Don't just rely on academic literature. Go to the place where these things that you are researching are actually being discussed and developed. I did not do this at the start. It took me a year and a half before I actually started um, looking at what was being posted on the IETF mailing lists and, and listening to what these people were saying. And you can't really do that. The, what, what I've noticed now is that the RFCs, they, they, are, they can say maybe only one tenth of what you actually need to know to really understand these protocols, right? And so if you want to have impacts, if you want to, um, to, to have something that's practically usable, you can't be on the sidelines of what you're researching. You have to, you know, um, directly try to interact with these people. Are you still there, Oliver? I think Oliver had some difficulty listening to me. Um, we can see him, yeah, we, but he looks... We can still see him, yeah. But I don't think he's, he's here. Yeah. I mean, he was asking me if you were still here, so I guess there is some connection. <laughs> If only we were running to logger queues. <laughs> well, the Google Meet uses Quick, so that's the problem. <laughs> Google. Yeah, now, <laughs> now the audio is just back, so I I think oh, I kind yeah. of lost you on the way. <laughs> you looked stunned by the reply, Oliver. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess um, I guess the the famous last question is that um, if you were to do the thesis again, is there anything that you would do differently? Better start thinking of a different question. Then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's indeed a typical one, um, and, and so I have um, to this is, this is difficult because um, despite what I have told you today, none of this was actually planned. Well, the start of this plan, we were going to look at HTTP2, but after that, we didn't really have plans to do QLaw, QVis with new protocols. This all happened 
kind of organically from, from what, we, uh, what we found, right? So to be conscious about this going back and then trying to <laughs> predict all of this happening is, is not something uh, that, uh, <coughs> that I can do. But what I do think is that I would have loved to have these tools uh, available for TCP and HTTP2 when I started. And if that would have been the case, then I would have been looking a lot more at TCP and congestion control. Because for the HP2 work, we mainly looked at HP2 stuff. We looked a little bit at the, the transport layer, but not too much. That's that's one of the things I think is, is a big, uh, I wouldn't say problem, but one of the, of the lackings of, of our earlier work is that we didn't consider TCP. If I would have had these tools, I would absolutely have looked at how the interactions with especially the congestion controller uh, dictate features like server push and also the initial phases of, uh, of the connection. And that's one of the things that I'm, I'm actually um, a bit sad about that I didn't go deeper into this, this is the whole congestion control um, algorithm thing. So I think I know enough to fake it by now, but uh, <laughs> I still don't know enough to actually, um, I think, understand all the underlying things there. That's, that's something I would have loved to have more time for to, to do better. Yeah. Is there any implementation of QLog for uh, TCP yet so that you could do a joint analysis of Yes. Cool. So um, Jonas, one of my master students, he, he wrote some eBPF probes so that we can extract uh, the congestion window and the latency RDT information from the kernel. And he then combined this with PCAPs um, to have like a proof of concept version. It's, it's nowhere near as smooth as for quick, but uh, it's something we're looking into and it would be a logical next step um, for, for QLog as well. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Then I think I have exceeded my time and I would hand over to the next one. Okay, thank, thank you, you uh, Professor Wolfbelt. And uh, we'll continue the questioning with uh, Dr. Kamra Sekaram. Please, Dr. Kamra Sekaram. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Uh, first of all, uh, yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed the, the talk, so thanks for um, the uh, entertaining and enlightening talk, at least uh, from my perspective. Um, Second, uh, I I really like how you politely said that people in academia work on useless things. So, <laughs> let's <laughs> be honest, uh, <laughs> some of us do. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of interesting and challenging questions are already asked by Lars and Oliver. So I'm gonna be I'm gonna take it easy on you. Um, so <laughs> let me let me start with something silly, right? So. Um, you, you did quite a lot of things, quite a lot of impressive stuff. Um, and hats off to you for that. Um, what if you were to, if you were to name one factor that made all of this difficult, all of the work that you did difficult, all of this debugging, you know, dissecting protocol behavior difficult? What would be that? Just one aspect. Basically, what I said at the beginning. You don't know if you're right. You're, you're seeing results. And you don't know if, if those are actual results or if there is a problem somewhere in your setup. And that problem can be anywhere. It can be in the implementation, in the protocol, in, in, in the network simulation, anywhere. And trying to find out where it is and why, especially at the beginning, is terrifying, very difficult. Um, so yeah, that. So before, you know, um, if we go dial back to, you know, the TCP era, right? I mean, when, you know, all we knew was TCP and, you know, extensions to it. I mean, we were able to do this, right? I mean, we typically would look at packet captures, you know, use uh, your command line tools, look at what was happening. Um, and uh, now, of course, in, you know, in Quake and in the modern era, such tools, you know, the visibility of such tools were limited. And so that's where I felt like your tool does quite a fantastic job. Uh, but is it enough? I mean, uh, does, so you said that, you know, there are so many factors, you know, you don't know exactly you're right, but with Klog and Q is now being there, already available, have you bridged the gap? Are we, are we there yet? Uh, not fully, no. I, I think that's what, what Lars was trying to get at, is that what you really want is to have to do no work at all. Is to have just tell the computer, this is what the problem is, this is where you messed up, and this is how you fix it, right? We're not obviously there yet, but I think it's it's so much more quicker now. What I can do now, if, if I have a, a trace in QLog, I can just go through the different visualizations 
each of which takes me about 30 seconds. And I can very quickly see which of these look like something I'd expect or not. If I would have to do this with TCP tools, I would be working several hours, I think, uh, setting them up and, and looking at the output. So I think it definitely has helped. It's mainly made the process a lot faster, easier to do. It hasn't fully solved the problem, no. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Because yeah, somehow because I here. seem to have lost the video. Um, okay, so let me continue then. Um, so that's that's great. That's it's good to know. Um, you you enlightened me on quite a lot of things. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, things were new to me, and I enjoyed learning about them and you know getting educated about. It. So that was nice. Uh, one thing I I feel, despite your entertaining and enlightening talk, that you left um, uh, me wondering or perplexed is the prioritization schemes. Okay. Um, can, can you repeat that? I didn't quite catch that. The one thing that I still have questions about or I still haven't gotten to grasp, uh, you know, grasped it yet is the prioritization schemes. Right? Okay. Now, one thing that, again, it's a silly question. So one thing that I couldn't understand was, did you say that most or all of the server implementations got the prioritization implementation wrong? <laughs> yes, of course. I, I, I couldn't put all the new ones in, into a small presentation. Um, some of them definitely get it wrong, and they don't really get it wrong. They just ignore the, the client side hints. And so they, they fall back to the default what the spec is saying. That's what most of them, I think, are doing wrong. Uh, others try to implement this, but then it goes wrong in, in terms of buffering and how you have different threads or, or different connections, putting everything on the sockets and um, basically, again, what is what is going on at the TCP layer and how the handoff between H2 and the kernel works. And this is what I think conclusion would be from Cloudflare's research is that there is a lot of problems there in, in how uh, data is buffered. And if you have too much buffering, both in the kernel and the network, it becomes difficult to do the reprioritization and you get uh, end results. So it's not like all these servers didn't go through at least a little bit of effort to implement this. It's that it is not enough to only implement this on the HTTP2 layer. It's that you need to have like a, a full stack view of what is happening. And I think the nice thing about Could, sorry for interrupting you. Is it is it fair to say that the uh, the assumptions behind what the server should do or what any of these implementations do is somehow you know there is a mismatch between what the client thinks and what the server thinks? Um, it's it's not like there is a mismatch between what they think. Um, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. It's, it's just that they um, try to follow what the client thinks, but um, uh, don't know how to do this correctly. The thing is, if there is indeed a mismatch between what the client says and what the server thinks, this was a big problem in HTTP2 because you couldn't really change the prioritization tree easily on the server side. Right? Because you don't know what it's going to look like. And if you want to add something or move something around, you don't know where it has to be um, in order to have the correct effect, at least not without even much more advanced algorithms. That's, for example, one thing that, that Cloudflare again did. They just ignore uh, the, the tree completely and they build their own system based on these high level uh, hints that they get in order to be able to move things around more deterministically. And that's the, what's, what we try to do with the new setup as well. It becomes much more simple to just tweak the position of, of, uh, of files in our prioritization logic to have the desired effect that if your server knows that you, you're dealing with a bad browser, this time it can actually be, be smarter than that. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any hope in, uh, you know, in any one prioritization scheme being you know, fit for all kinds of scenarios or? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, um, like this is a lot of previous work, um, like what I said, the Pilatus papers and the Shandian papers, and they they very clearly show that you need to tweak your prioritization scheme for each individual website or page to get optimal results. I think that's that's very important. Again, so, this is is that is that a subtle way of diplomatic way of you saying it's never going to get done right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Because what I was going to say is that we. Uh, uh, proposed future work that might do it better. <laughs> um, it's, it's difficult to do it. You can do it right, but it costs you a lot of effort, right? All, all these tools, like Scout, 
you can do this, but it costs a lot of upfront effort. And if your page changes, you, you have to do it again and all so forth. It's too much overhead to be practically usable. What we propose in the HT prioritization paper is to go like for the middle ground that you would have a browser supporting 10 or 20 different schemes and the server telling you, well, my page works best on this type of scheme. So use this scheme if, if you're able to, which is much better than each browser just choosing one scheme and sticking to that um, religiously, right? Um, so we can do the perfect thing, but it's not really practical, I think. Um, okay, I think I'm I mean, I have five more minutes. So um, I was going to ask what, uh, unfortunately, Oliver already asked. So, but let me, let me continue on the answer you provided to Oliver's last question. So you said if you were to do it all you know, from scratch, um, you would have probably invested more time looking into transport layer congestion control. Um, now, um, could, you, could you tell me a bit more? I mean, um, so in, in, let me just provide a little more context to help you answer, right? So I thought when Keith uh, Weinstein and others you know, published the Pantheon at Usenix ATC, I thought this was like a dumb deal. Um, you know, they, they provided, and in fact, in one of you know, my review, I wrote the same thing, I guess, right? So I said, like, your work in some sense represents to me, or falls uh, maybe is like one step closer to providing the Pantheon for, you know, evaluating the protocols. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, but given that you mentioned transport layer and condition control, what, what do you think are still unsolved there? Or what, what would be your next step? Given that you mentioned you would have, you might have done that instead of this. <laughs> I'm not sure if there are um, big unsolved there. The, the reason, how did you do that? Fall. Fall <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't see it. I, I'm not sure if I know what the things are unsolved because I, I'm not an expert in that area. The reason I would look into these more is is for how they interact with uh, the application layer. For example, the, your, your size of your initial congestion window can have a massive impact on your uh, web metrics, right? Because it depends on how much you can send in that first flight and how much packet loss you have in the beginning. And then now with HTTP 3 is what we looked at is you can actually start choosing not to retransmit uh, lower priority stuff instead of high priority stuff and so on and so forth. That's mainly what I meant. If I would have to give some conjecture about unsolved problems in congestion control, um, one of the things I've always found very weird is fairness. So many papers, so many people talking about it. We've solved it. We, we make a new BBR protocol. Google says it's completely fair. 25 papers after that says, no, actually, it, uh, it's, it's exactly the opposite of that, right? Um, it's the fact that fairness is, after 30 years, still a very, very hot topic discussed at hotnets is very strange to me. And it's, and it's again something that I think might be researched a bit better if we had access to logs from big companies, seeing how these things are working on actual networks in the wild, which is something that QLog might help with uh, in time. Okay, uh, since you answered that quickly, I'll, I'll squeeze in one more. Um, so, uh, again, a more philosophical question. Um, so what's next for you um, as you go forward? And how much of what you have done so far has influenced that decision? Um, well, first of all, the obvious, I want to keep on working on QLog and QVis because um, I think it's useful and it's nice that people are using it and I like compliments, so that's obvious. Um, the other thing I, I look forward to researching next is, is something I also mentioned in the, in the update to the thesis, is, is see if we can make like the the fully formed feedback loop between how a web page is, is built in terms of resources and how that is actually being transported in terms of congestion control. And if you know what you're going to be able to send in the next flight or what the type of packet loss is, you can actually dynamically switch the type of resources that your network, that your website is using and so on. You can start to dynamically um, combine these things. This is, this is again something that I've been looking forward to, to, to during the whole PhD never had the tools or the time or the insights, which I do think I, I might start to be having now. Um, and so that's that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to looking into, yeah. Thanks. Um, I, 
I, I think I'll, I'll stop at this point and thank you for patiently answering all my questions. And once again, it was a brilliant talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra Sikaran. Uh, then uh, next is uh, Professor Bonaventure. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, thank you. So thank you, Robin, for the for the nice and entertaining presentation. Um, let me go quickly to some technical questions. So you said that uh, Qlog is now used by uh, Facebook, and in the beginning of the thesis, uh, you you looked a lot at HTTP two prioritization, and then you explained that HTTP three prioritization is different. And I was wondering whether, assuming that you would work for Facebook, for example instead of staying in Hasselt. So let's assume you move to Facebook, you have access to lots of data, and based on the QLog data that Facebook collects, can you um, detect whether the HTTP3 prioritization schemes works as expected or not? And what kind of uh, a study would you do to be able to uh, get this information? Okay. Um, I think we will be able to do that kind of a study. Um, using using the Q logs, I think it would be a little bit more difficult and, and different from my other research. Though is because with Facebook you will be focusing on one main site. It's one main web page that is that is a very specific way of being built, spe uh, specific way of being engineered. Facebook has other web pages, of course, but you wouldn't be trying to optimize the prioritization problem for as many websites as possible. You would be looking at very one very concrete example. And I think if you're if you're doing that, it doesn't really matter anymore. I think if if you know exactly what you're sending, if you have a large team, you can pretty much ignore what the browser is sending you and just have your server send things in the correct order uh, anyway, or do something custom. For example, Facebook uh, Big Pipe did this uh, very early on, right? So, um, what I do think would, would be interesting is to look at the queue logs and see. Um, for example, the impact of, of head of line blocking in quick um, and that kind of stuff, how that actually impacts what they're doing on their networks. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and then, so you said that, so now that Facebook has lots of data, it would be nice if they could share it with researchers, but they would only do that provided that there is a good way to anonymize the QLog data. So what would be required to anonymize the QLog data so that it can be shared uh, safely by companies like Facebook with researchers? Yeah, excellent question. And that is, of course, also ongoing work for, for QLog. Something that I don't think I have the necessary expertise in to, to do all by myself. Um, what I think needs to happen is, is not so much the removal of data, but maybe replacing it with, um, with uh, anonymized versions, right? Like, for example, if, if you start removing all the IP addresses and all the connection IDs, you also lose uh, the, a way of identifying what type of network you were on for this QLog or, or um, how different connections relate to each other, which is um, taken away some of the, of the purpose, some of the usefulness. So I think we need to find ways of safely transforming privacy sensitive data into, for example, anonymized hashing. Um, so that we can still do this tracking but if you would have the queue logs together with a live network trace, you wouldn't be able to match up the two um, side by side so that you could keep the privacy um, for, for real life users and still uh, expose this. Now, I do know that there is existing research for this, for example, anonymizing databases and that kind of stuff, um, but I haven't actually looked into it myself too much um, to this point. But uh, another possibility for for Facebook would be instead of uh, providing access to raw anonymized data, would be to provide um, an API that allows you to query the data while preserving the an anonymity. So how would you design this kind of API that would give access to the QLog data, but while preserving anonymity? Ooh. <laughs> I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think, like what I said before, what Facebook is doing now, it's it's very very interesting. They allow you to just run uh, something like an SQL query mm -hmm. over their entire database, and they can, they can give you the interesting uh, traces for that. So that's. But I think an API could look like or should look like if they want to host something like that. 
And then the anonymization part is, is um, what I said before, you need to, uh, you don't really need to anonymize what you store in the database if they don't want to, you just need to anonymize it when you give it back to the user using the, um, using the API. Um, but then you would provide um, aggregate metrics, such as the, such as the average percentage and stuff like that. Uh, no, I, I think that takes away from the power of QLog. Like one of the powerful things that you can do is is get the raw data and run your own analyses and get the really deep insights. If you would just have an API that shares with you some general statistics of what was found in in, in the traces, of course it would be helpful, right? But that wouldn't be very much different from what Facebook and Google are doing now, publishing papers themselves with some of these random um, statistics. I don't think that's enough. I think if they want to do it, they, they need to do it correctly and uh, expose as much of the queue logs as, as possible. Mm -hmm. So you, you spend lots of time developing queue log and QVs for quick. And my impression is that there would be lots of benefits in applying a similar approach to other protocols. And I would like to, you to think about different protocols and just give us one example of, of a protocol where it would be easy and useful to apply uh, something equivalent to QLog and QVIS and what we could expect from that. And another protocol where it would be very difficult, difficult to apply QLog and QVIS or similar techniques and explain why. These are the type of difficult questions I was afraid of. Um, so very easy to apply is, of course, um, TCP and HTTP2. I think those, those are the, yeah. the, the obvious the obvious ones to, uh, to go from there. And also some other um, relatively simple um, um, application layer protocols like DNS that we're running on top. One of the things I think is very challenging um, is, is um, uh, real-time media, things like WebRTC. Those are really completely different stacks, um, also with highly advanced complex algorithms driving the video streaming logic. And you can't just get away there with logging, with queue logging the, the packet level information. You would also need to log a lot of the application layer logic that you're using to drive the video streaming. And this is actually something that uh, that my colleague Joris is working on, is, is trying to apply QLog and QVIS to, to ABR streaming logic for Dash, for example. Um, but I think that's that's quite doable. But using that for WebRTC and, and including things like ICE and STUN and, and all the other things in there as well would be a, a substantial uh, uh, difficult effort, yeah. But, but there the, the difficulty is in interaction between multiple protocols. Am I right? Yes. Okay, maybe an, a next, another question is that uh, with QLog, QVIS, you have a view which is on either the client or the server side. Don't you think that it could be useful in some cases to have also uh, to collect some logs from the other side of the connection and get it back and include it in QLog so that, for example, if you are a Facebook server, then you could ask your Facebook client to provide some logs for some events that are relevant for the server and then transmit them over the quick connection. In quick, you can have frames that can carry whatever you want. So that's possible to add that information as a, as a QLog stream or whatever. That's, that's actually it, what Facebook is doing. So Facebook so they, is coming back from the client? Um, this is difficult because the, when, when I interviewed them, they said that they definitely do this, but it's difficult to run full Q logs at the client because it's, it has a little bit too much performance overhead. So they do partial Q logs on the client and then indeed send it back to, um, to the server. And that's, that's a lot of what, uh, what we've been doing with quick debugging as well, right? This is one of the nice and unique things I think about the sequence diagram is that you can load both the client side and the server side Q log in one view um, and get this nicely uh, correlated. Um, there is even a, a provision in the QLog draft that defines a well-known URL um, for which, for example, the client in this case would be able to ask the server to send the QLog data for a given connection using that uh, URL. Um, but you could just as uh, easily use that URL, for example, to post 
uh, a keylog or a partial keylog that you would need to the server. But, and but why, do, why, why would you need a specific URL while, while you have already a connection with streams? Sure. It's, <laughs> it can be done via many different, uh, um, many different mechanisms. The thing is that the well-known URL was used in a related proposal for HTTP2 originally, so that you can do it separately. You don't need to use the current quick connection because, of course, that can impact the quick connection itself, uh, right? So to be more flexible, we could do that. But you can, um, if the well-known URL is on the same server, you could also just, of course, open a new HTTP tree stream and send it on that. Okay. So thank you. I guess I've finished the technical questions. Thank and you. but yesterday you you promised that you would mention RFC eleven forty nine, and I was very <laughs> disappointed that it did not appear in your presentation. Can you explain more? I, I, I did. did. I did. It wasn't. Oh boy, oh boy. I mean, uh, <laughs> can I can I easily go back to? Uh, that's going to take a while. Was, uh, so we're in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second because I want to want to make very very clear what I did. Uh, yeah, there we go. There we go. You, what was the previous slide and was the next one? Or did uh, I miss it? The, the previous one was the the image of the IETF. Yes. And then the next was the, the summary of the uh, of the introduction. It was, it was when I explained that, that, that if the ITF is eventually able to reach consensus, which it rarely does, um, it will then produce an RFC document, which is the, the RFC standard. Yeah. Okay, then thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor Bonaventure. Uh, Professor Lieseborgs? Dag Robin, goedenavond. Thank you. Uh, I will continue in English. Uh, so thank you very much for your nice presentation and for your work overall. Um, I really enjoyed both. Um, now, as you know, I'm a part-time physicist. And as a physicist, I like to think about experiments. Now, uh, one thing you know when you do experiments is that when you measure something, it always influences the result. And of course, of course, you try to make that effect as small as possible, but it's always there. So. I was wondering when you when you do your logging, your Q log logging, and you measure things, at, at which point start they affecting the behavior of the system? At which point the logs start to get in the way? Yep. Um, that can definitely happen. And so Q log, especially the, the first versions, use JSON, um, which is an easy to use format, but it has quite a bit of, uh, of overhead. And that has actually been one of the main uh, critiques that we have had, especially from larger companies like, like uh, Microsoft, um, on, on that this overhead would, would become problematic in practice. The thing that you can do to manage this is, is use a different serialization format um, to do it in a more binary fashion, for example, which is how we evolved Qlog to also make that easier to do uh, in practice. Even then, of course, you will still have some impact. It can be alleviated by, for example, logging on a separate thread or, or uh, delaying the logging processing, keeping it in memory until everything is done. But even that can, of course, have, have impact. So what you could do is, is start logging, um, what's, what's the world called? Do sampling, do only logging of, of a select uh, amount of connections, which you obviously do at scale. Uh, or you can only start logging when you start to notice there is a problem or there is a potential problem on the connection already. So that, yes, you might make it worse, <laughs> or you might make it different using the logging, but at least uh, you know that there was a problem before you started to log. OK. Um, now, you, you mentioned in your text and also on the slides uh, that when you did your experiments using HTTP2, that sometimes the results were better than HTTP1, and sometimes they were worse. Now, HTTP1 is, of course, very old. And it has, a, it has had a lot of time to mature, which, which of course, is not the case for, for H2. Um, so I was wondering, if we had given H2 more time to, to mature, would it, would it have overcome some of these problems and actually be always at least as fast as HTTP1? Or are there very well, well, inherent problems in the design that 
cannot really be overcome at, at all. And, and are you perhaps making the same mistake with, with HTTP3? And then already starting to think very early on about HTTP4 before actually figuring out what, what all the problems are. Um, I, I think there are fundamental problems with HTTP2 uh, that are also still there in HTTP3. Um, one, one of the main reasons why HTTP2 can be slower in some cases is that you're just using one connection, one congestion controller. While for HTTP1, you will open six parallel connections and sometimes even up to 30. And so you have 30 different congestion controllers all bumping up the send rate uh, as fast as they can, which if you're on a good network, on a cable network, that won't really lead to much problems. And that's, that's kind of why we were able, I think, to use HTTP2, HTTP1 for such a long time. The fact that we now switch back to the single connection um, makes it better for worse networks you know, cellular um, or maybe even Wi-Fi where you don't have this capacity. Um, but I think it's very, very difficult to make HTTP1 consistently faster over HTTP. Let me rephrase that. It's difficult to make HTTP2 consistently faster over HTTP1 um, if HTTP1 is using multiple connections. Um, now, the, the other part of the question was, was interesting because um, we have seen something similar with Quick versus TCP. TCP has been obviously optimized for a very long time. And so in the kernel, the TCP code paths are very, very fast. That was not the case for UDP. As it turns out, UDP, people use it, but it was never really optimized. And now suddenly for Quick, we suddenly need all these optimizations that we had for TCP as well. And that's something that we've seen in the past two years, I think, is that kernels are fastly catching up, implementing these, these, implement, these, uh, these uh, optimizations for UDP as well. Um, getting them as close as possible to sometimes even a bit better than, than TCP, what I've seen. Um, so given more time, yes, we can get much closer than them together. I think there are fundamental differences between these protocols. Um, I don't think those fundamental differences matter too much, usually, in most cases, in most networks, but they're still there uh, and can be used or abused. Okay. Um... I was also wondering about something you said earlier in one of the other questions. Um, when, when I was thinking about the kind of data that a, a company like Google or Amazon collects, you're thinking that this is really a lot of data. So they must have, uh, they, they should be able to do something automatically, like in the, in the trend of machine learning. So, um, but, but you said earlier, there, there will always be some need for a human component, which, which makes it, of course, difficult for machine learning. Um, so, yeah, I'm not really sure. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, is, is machine learning to optimize these, these protocols or, or their behavior, their implementations possible? Or, or is it just something that's, well, where the outcome is really too, too subjective to determine what's, what's really good and what's not? No, like, like I said, I think you can get most of the way, like say 95% with techniques like machine learning. I myself am very skeptical of machine learning for this because there are so many moving variables that I think it would be very difficult to, to train uh, algorithms to, to do this properly. But let's say we can. I think you can definitely get to a point where, where most of these things can be analyzed automatically. And that's exactly the thing, most of them but not the remainder. And that's, that's the key part. If you know what the remainder is, then you can just give this to the humans to analyze. But this is definitely not something that we're there yet. I know there's related work for machine learning for TCP, but I've also read that that has some significant limitations. So. Okay. Um, now at the, at the very start of your PhD, I think your interest was also about well, the, the actual automization of web performance, uh, well, the, the, make, making it fully automated, basically. And, yep. and having, having done the, ex the experiments that you did, do you think that's, that's possible? Or is there also, again, this, this human factor that's, well, that, that makes it impossible? Um, it's just kind of uh, what I replied to a different question as well. I think it's definitely possible to a certain extent. It will yeah. be very difficult to make a system that looks at all the different aspects, all the different layers in the proper way. This is what I said that I would like to work on now, 
to do the, the full loop uh, to see if it's possible. I, I think we can get there uh, again quite far. Um, now I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we can get quite far. However, I think it's not going to scale. I think it's just going to have too much overhead to do this for each individual web page. I'm not sure we can do this in an online fashion and generic algorithm that just works without creating more overhead than, than the benefits that we can see, except for something like the Googles and the Facebooks. But then the question becomes, why don't they just manually optimize their things instead? Okay. Um, well, I was going to ask you, what is the capital of Assyria? But I'm pretty sure you already looked it up. <laughs> the capital of Assyria is Assur. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. These were my questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Lisa Morris. And we now get to uh, Professor Lamont, the co advisor. Thank you. Um, since Oliver already took my obvious question, I have to fall back to two backup questions. Um, also, a little bit related to Chapter 15, um, of course. Um, the first thing is um, you had quite a, a diff uh, different uh, route towards uh, the PhD in the sense that you started uh, already as a student as, as uh, um, intern in uh, Washington in industry, uh, then you went to industry, you, you really uh, you even joined um, uh, a startup company, etc. Um, but then decided to come back to uh, to the university. How do you feel now about that trajectory? Um, would it have been better to do this earlier or is it very good to be mature and come back later? What could you suggest to students uh, who are on this point of choosing? That's, that's difficult because there is survivor bias, right? Yeah. <laughs> From my perspective, it has been tremendously useful to have more experience before starting a PhD. Like, for example, the skills I needed to make the QVIS tools are something that I already had through my work um, before that. If I didn't have those and I wanted to make them, then I might have again been scared away from doing that because it would seem like too much work. Well, now it was something I enjoyed. That's one of the things um, <laughs> I sometimes said that, that I started QVIS not because it seemed like a good thing to do, but just because I wanted to make visualizations because I like it. Um, this is something, if you're a bit more mature, you have more experience, you start to find out what you really find interesting, uh, what you really want to, to research in this case, which I think some um, uh, PhD students typically struggle with in their, in their first years. It's, it's what, what is interesting to me? What, what can I spend the next three years on uh, without you know, becoming bored? And I think for me, it was clear that I was interested in performance in, in these low level things and uh, that, that helped me. And final question, do you deserve your PhD? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote an entire chapter on why. I think yeah, the answer is yes. Still, it was still going both ways. Uh, I, I think by now, the answer, just, just to give some context to the, to the audience. So I wrote an entire chapter uh, at the end of the thesis um, 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 uh, defending why I would deserve a PhD, because my PhD has is, is not been a typical PhD. Uh, it's been a bit more applied than, than most people typically do. Um, and, and last year I did a presentation for the colleagues where I said, I'm a, I'm a bit worried that I don't have enough uh, academic output. Um, but this year we were able to, to use, like I said, QLog and QVIS to actually get two more papers. papers which I think are, are, are some of my best work, uh, especially the last one. Um, so now I'm, I'm kind of okay with both sides. <laughs> I think I've done something practical. I also think I've done uh, at least a little bit of good academic output. So I think, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. You will know very soon. Uh, <laughs> so I now go to uh, Professor Quax, the advisor. Yeah, for the sake of time, I will uh, not ask any further questions from Robert. We've had lots of opportunities to discuss things, so uh, I will just uh, leave him be at the moment and 
Well, I thought I thought we were gonna. Yeah, that's, that's from afterwards, right? Yeah. So don't touch my sword. Just leave it here, and then <laughs> you'll do that part afterwards. And then we have you know, Frage on the public, and that of the public also the the public in that online. So I think or that there are no questions from the public. Are there questions from the audience? Please do. <laughs> So if, if there are questions from the audience, you can you can ask them now um, in the chat or just enable your your video and audio. Or just open your microphone that will be easier. Yeah. Okay, I, I have the good or perhaps the bad question of always asking a question from the public. Um, so I'll like to do it as well. So thanks, Robin, for your very exciting presentation and for not beheading yet anyone. Um, but my question would be: You said that the prioritization is difficult. But could it be the case that a developer of a website is able to define its own prioritization and would you be able to do it and have, have good performance or is it just too complicated? <laughs> uh, both. Um, I think it should be possible and there are proposals that do that. But some people like Google are, are blocking those even though it's their own proposal, <laughs> strangely <laughs> enough. Um, they're, they're blocking this a little bit because um, these are, like you say, very complex things. You, you need to understand how all of this fits together and it's very easy to do it wrong. And so if they just expose mm -hmm. this type of API, which we've seen with other APIs like, like preload and prefetch, if, if they do it wrong, they actually make things much worse without understanding it. And so I think it's possible. I think it should be possible. I don't think we'll see it soon. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, this concludes the public defense of your thesis. In the is dus the public verdediging the common thesis beëindigd. The jury zal ook een deel van dat zich hier bevindt als de deel dat zich online bevindt zal zich nu terugtrekken om te beraadslagen. Lieve hier. En dat geldt uiteraard ook voor uh, uw publiek dat uh, op zich online bevindt, liever hier het resultaat daarvan uh, af te wachten. Ah, yes, of course, Lucas, you're, you're right. Uh, and we've talked about this. <laughs> you know, uh, yes, mask. Mask definitely has the same, uh, the same problems. I think it's actually much more difficult to do mask um, than, than multipod. And I've been thinking about it. I have some ideas, but uh, I, I want you to get your mask implementation up and running first. Um, so I have some, I have some logs, and then I, and then I can start to, uh, to to try out some things, see see what actually works uh, in practice, you know. Now we we can't hear you, Lucas. And bedankt, Peter, Bram, Matthew. Lucas, you're muted. I'm not sure if that's. Well, we, we still can't hear you. I'm not sure if you can. Uh... <laughs> Jan, please, please do. Please, please do that for me in the chat. I, uh, I had a question, Robin. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering, is there anything, I uh, see Lucas has just dropped now, so it's an ideal time to ask, is there anything that's in the um, HP spec or quick spec now that you don't 
agree with, you don't think should be there, or you have certain issues with? Uh, yes, <laughs> the the HTTP three prioritization. I have, I have serious issues with that. Um, so again, we, we are defining a scheme, a much simpler scheme, but we're not actually telling people how to use it in practice. We're not giving any practical guidance. It's just, uh, it's just here's the scheme. And if you're Google or Facebook, you probably know what to do with it. Everyone else, please just figure it out yourself. That's a bit a harsh way of stating it, but that's the way I see it. And I've been trying to get these people to, to, to more give a, to more explain what the proper use of this would be in spec, but that's typically not the way the specs are built. And I hope still that, I, I know Lucas uh, would also like a separate document for that, explaining how this can be used in practice, what to look out for, and, and that kind of thing. I don't think it's going to be a spec or something. We, we will have to see what to do with that. But that uh, that's in general very frustrating to me with the, the IETF RFCs. They have very little context um, about why some of the things are there. They just describe the features, but not why you need them or how to use them, uh, which is uh, difficult, yeah. Great, can, thanks. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, Lucas. Yeah, Hi. Yay. The hardest problems of the internet are uh, uh, audiovisual, <laughs> not protocols. Yeah, especially with COVID, right? Yeah, so I apologize for the bad audio. I'm in a shed. Uh, but. Um, well, I was going to say about mask. Yeah, I, I was debugging something today or, or late last night, and it's I needed to look at effectively four traces for one uh, one thing that I was interested in, and maybe with some visualization changes it could help. But I, I don't quite know. There's a lot of different options there, and I think that my experience so far with QLog is that you learn by doing, and like either watching people try to debug an issue, like. I can't anticipate what I needed to know and see before there was a problem I was trying to investigate. Yeah, yeah. And, and it turned out in this case, my, my suspicion is it's nothing to do with the protocol. It's a implementation behavior in one of the legs of a proxied tunneled quick connection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. yeah, so I think there's, a, there's some interesting stuff there and um, uh, what, how we solve that for multipath or, or mask, I don't know. So I, I'm just really excited for what more can be done in the future and what are the, you know, it's not all on Robin's shoulders and or or his associates to f fix this and build the tools. The, the whole point of the format is it's open and so that, you know, we can contribute or, or try to do things, but those tools are very helpful. Um, on the prioritization point, like, you know, there have been, uh, you know, uh, so disclosure, I'm a co-editor of the um, extensible priorities scheme for HP2 and 3. Uh, that's an ID, an adopted ID in the HP working group. Um, Lucas is one of the big wigs in the IETF. He's also the chairman of the quick working group. Uh, along with Lars. So he does the hard work. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, but, uh, yeah, you know, we've we've had a few people open issues saying it'd be much better if you had specific guidance. Like if you saw this, these things, then you would do this specific um, action. But you know, the challenge for web servers, say as as an example, it's not the only thing that uses HTTP, of course. But you know, a a web server that's running at high scale needs to also work for the operator. So yes, the client might have a perfect worldview of what it wants, but you can quickly, if, if you have such strict rules about how things behave, then that becomes a great avenue to, to attack the server and and tie up its resources. And so uh, I, I might have missed it if you mentioned it, Robin, but like uh, with the H2 spec, you, uh, like we, I think it was last year, there was a report of major DOS vulnerabilities across a whole swathe of, of different implementations written in different languages. Some common, some only affect, like some types of attack only affected certain implementations, but for, for a specification that was quite tied down um, and had so far not demonstrated vulnerabilities like that, for so many to have been found at the same point is very interesting. And a lot of those were not, oh, I can like leak information, but I can tie up the, the, the resources by something like the priority tree adding a lot of entries and then shuffling them one by one. And so, um, you know, that that was part of this spec to say, this is how you should do things, even though it also said it's a hint and you don't have to, if you choose to take the hint on, you still open the door to 
um, being vulnerable to certain things that can be hard mm -hmm. to anticipate in advance. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you for coming as well. Oh, it's been a brilliant session. So thanks a lot. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Hey, Robin, can you hear me? Hey, Dr. Tan. I thought I might as well ask a question as well. Of course. So now that you've, you're at the end of the PhD, uh, and I guess with two, I don't know, almost a year more under the belt since I left, how do you see the adoption of Quick outside of the big companies now? Um, um, still, still very low, right? Um, simply because the, the, the implementations, the, the servers that people typically use like Nginx and, and Node.js and Apache, they don't have functioning Quick implementations, uh, or at least not mature ones. And I think it's, it's going to take until then to upgrade to, to you know, like uh, for, for Apache to deliver a good quick implementation before the other people start using it. Um, on the origins, right? Of course, the CDNs are starting to deploy it, and that means that a large part of the internet immediately will use quick where possible. But I think it will take a very long time for, for, for normal people or normal servers to, to, to catch up to that. Um, for example, in the, Node.js, they're using OpenSSL, which is planning to add quick support in, you know, end of next year. Uh, I mean, that becomes difficult to, uh, to fast track, right? But that's why I think uh, using CDNs, which most people who care about performance already do, you know, you'll, you'll be able to get that much faster, you know? Mm -hmm. So how are, how are you, Dan? How are things at Facebook? Well, I guess it's not quick, but it's something completely different. So still very interesting. Well, like I said, that's that's one of the things that I would like to look into sometime in the future. Is the whole lower layer physical stuff uh, seems seems very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> definitely thanks, think thanks twice. I would say <laughs> you don't know what you're getting into. <laughs> So uh, solid, my, uh, my favorite color is uh, blue, uh, green, sorry. Well, I should throw you off the bridge then. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, is, this is the question I expected from the jury, but none of them asked it. So I'm, I'm very disappointed by, by the, the Monty Python knowledge uh, in senior academia today. I also um, only recognized the the song you used on the bottom of every slide. I only <laughs> recognized it when it was too late. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's that song. And I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post the slides online um, because I made a few tweaks. Of course, I, I added some new lyrics. Yeah, yeah, I missed some slides with the lyrics. What a pity. <laughs> but I'm a bit senior as you, and I've been using the Monty Python sketch on the bridge in my introductory first lesson of Python, because Python is <laughs> named after. <laughs> I, I still think fondly of, um, of, of our introductory course to Java, which is being taught by, um, oh, come on, Frank Meven. And mm -hmm. his, his whole uh, uh, course was, was uh, littered with, with memes. Fantasy memes, science fiction memes, uh, uh, references to Ankh Morpork, that kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of students were like, what the hell is this? Why is this in, you know, in, in, a, in a textbook? And I thought it was great. You know. Yeah. I think also his first lesson is. Um... The one where you have to throw airplanes to the front of the, the class, which is pretty oh, that's new interesting. Then. I didn't uh, I didn't have well, that. Well, that that was a few years ago, so <laughs> probably not that new. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jasper asks, "What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow?" Uh, it's probably higher than that of a laden swallow, and uh, depends on whether it's an African or European swallow, right? 
It's probably the, the topic of my next PhD. <laughs> Well, that's actually the question I answered in my first lesson on Python. There's actually a complete website about this. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I shouldn't be surprised, right? Thanks, everyone, for staying, by the way. Because uh, <laughs> this, this, this can get a bit uh, boring. I'm, I'm first going to give my, my, my fiancé a kiss now because I've been ignoring her, so be right back. <laughs> <laughs> Must be some kiss because everybody else leaves the room. <laughs> yeah. And now the jury would suddenly enter. <laughs> That's not on camera. So I, I have a, a question for the, the Hasselt um, uh, members that are, are here, that I believe are here based on the participant list, is why why do you all shout your surnames? Uh, the reason I say that is because in the quick specs, we shout quick because it's capitalized. And yeah, why have you all got capital letters? Mm. Yeah. Wat vonden de mama en de papa ervan eigenlijk? Die hebben we nog niet gezien. Die slapen al. <laughs> Ik hoop van niet. <laughs> yeah, regarding the capital letters, it just in the you hustled system, surnames are always capitalized. I don't know why. I'm not you hustled, but I see it with my you hustled colleagues that for some reason they do this. I think nobody knows why at you hustled as well. Ah, <laughs> uh, there they are. Uh, <laughs> they're not asleep. <laughs> no, that's you can get it. This is not by a <laughs> Come again. 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 Come Come again. Come again. Come again. Come again. Come again. <laughs> they, they were asking when we would uh, get home for the fries because I haven't eaten yet. Proficient, huh? What? Proficient, I'm not sure. I have not heard all of it. But it was good. 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 It was Proficient. That's me. Yeah, with the capitalization, I, I always have problems um, knowing which is the first name from uh, from Asian people, for example. It's also very, very, very difficult to know which is the first name, which is the last name, and how to address them uh, if they don't have it in their signature, for example. And I think capitalizing the, the last name. Uh, Makes makes sense. Mm. Well, I like to use oi. Oi. Thanks, Kira. Ze is een moeilijke bevalling boven. Zo. 
Vocês querem que eu representasse? Ik ben geen zorgen maken, die hebben schrik van je zwaard. Broodjes. Wat? Ja, kiezen hem. Ik hou de frietjes voor hem. Dit is een vraag. Dit is een vraag die voor audio en video. Het kan zijn. Quick is very similar to TCP. Um, you can transport anything you like on top of it. The thing is that for, for audio and video, you typically use uh, UDP if it has to be live. Because UDP allows you to do much faster recovery of loss or, or discard of, of things that will be too late anyway. And so usually you, you've used UDP for, for this, like things like WebRTC will use um, um, UDP. The nice thing is that Quick runs on top of UDP. And so Quick can do both reliable traffic and unreliable traffic at the same time. Um, so this is something that can be done. It's not done yet. Uh, people will start doing it probably. The nice thing is that for, I think for some audio video systems, you need both a UDP and a TCP connection, right? For the control stream, mm -hmm. which you can now all, all do in, inside of a single quick connection, um, at least in theory. <laughs> um, the web transport was upcoming. Yeah, and a uh, quick point from uh, Jordis, there's, there's something called web transport, which will be um, um, kind of replacing web sockets in the browser. Uh, offering you both reliable and unreliable data in, in the browser. Uh, also WebRTC can be seen as a replacement. For the replacement for WebRTC is what Jordis is saying. You see, he's, he's already surpassing me uh, in, in his second year, so. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> Stop showing off, Jordis. I'll try after. <laughs> <laughs> It's only possible possible because of the beautiful work Robin laid out before me. Or else I wouldn't be saying this stuff. So all credits due where they are due. <laughs> me? I, I don't know what's taking so long. Just ja, gewoon Google nu achterlegen ook quick zou gebruiken voor niets en dan wat er boven ons tekst staat. Ja. Uh. Unless you can answer questions on the defense. <laughs> Shut up. I, I must have answered some questions really badly and now they're they're deciding whether I should uh, whether I should still get a PC or nothing. I don't know. We'll see. Dude, stop beating yourself up. You did great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> Which is my favorite. Uh, it's this very obscure uh, implementation called Quicker. <laughs> 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 so it's quick and then K-E-R. You should, you should look that up uh, on GitHub. That's, that's by far, by far my, my favorite. Yeah. Oh, Kenny Quick McDool. <laughs> yeah, that would actually be better, you know. <laughs> no, from, from all the other ones, I really like uh, uh, Quick and Flopka, obviously. Um, just because uh, uh, the, the obvious connotation, it's, it's just sad that people outside of, of Belgium and the Netherlands don't get the reference. Uh, yeah. Yes, Peter, of course. Yes, yes. P Peter in the chat is, is the person developing Quick and Flock for context. <laughs> it 
Stressiemoment is over, hè? Ja. <laughs> Man, wat is dat? I've been standing on my feet for three hours, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the worst thing. Normally, without COVID, we would now go out to like a very fancy restaurant and uh, have a very good meal. But yeah, that's that's not going to happen. Has to be the last comment. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> oh God. <sighs> Overall, that went better than expected, I'd say. Die staat nog niet in band. Nog niet. Ik heb het alarm opgezet voor ongeveer dat ook nog kent. Oeps. Online. me, all possible quick uh, uh, quips have been made multiple times <laughs> in the IDF. Uh, annoyingly so. Dan is waar na twee uur zoiets waar het vasthouden. <laughs> It's not really that heavy. Ik zou het wel eens. Maar dat valt eigenlijk inderdaad. Ik zou het geen ganse dag willen van ons leven. Maar... I, I picked my uh, lightest sword for this. Yeah. I have one that's about a kilogram heavier and that. Yeah. But the real, the real question is, how long can you, can you hold it like this? <laughs> That's the real question. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, then there. Yeah. Quick pull cool. <laughs> what is our favorite stance when performing a sword fight? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I'm lazy, so I typically use the left plow. Um, But I actually kind of like um, the the rose, which is something like this, or uh, one of the things I think is, is fanciest is the schlüssel. It's a bit like this. <laughs> It looks stupid, but from here you can actually initiate a stab that goes very far into your uh, into your opponent. It's a very cool sport. You should come join us. Um, we're always looking for members. After COVID. Oh, one of the jury members is back. So. Oh boy. Albert is not a good stance, Linda. Hmm. No dance. How long can I hold it like that? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure, not more than a couple of minutes. Uh, 
Deze commissie belast door de rector van de Transnationale Universiteit Limburg met de toekenner van de graad van dokter in de wetenschappen in informatica. Heeft gehoord de publieke verdediging door Robin Marx van zijn proefschrift getiteld Debugging Modern Web Protocols. Heeft er volgens beraadslaagd. En heeft na beraadslaging beslist om toe te kennen aan de heer Robin Marx, de graad van dokter in wetenschappen in informatica. En dit met de bijzondere felicitaties van de jury. Proficiat. <applaus> Uiteraard delen ook uh, promotor en co-promotor mee uh, in dit mooie resultaat. En um, de, de promotor, uh, professor Kwax, had graag nog een paar uh, woordjes tot u uh, gericht. En uh, ik geef hem graag het woord. Peter, alsjeblieft. Graag dan een topje. Ook een Of we de prijker terug in de praat krijgen. Even nog één ding aanpassen. Het vraagt is van mama dat het zal zijn. Poekie. Poekie, inderdaad. Is het zichtbaar, jongens? Uh, wat is zichtbaar? De slide zelf? Nee, is het niet in het Ah, nee, right. Wacht, wacht, wacht. Ik moet ze wel kunnen doen. Wacht, wacht, wacht. Wacht, wacht, wacht. Ik heb zo vier kilometer op mijn desktop staan, maar ik zei dus dat ik het al heb Mooi, dat is mooi gemaakt. Dat is het uh, tweede desktop, hè? Ja, ik wil het gewoon zo aan zien. Heel zeker. Ik denk dat het All right. Uh, sorry for the external jury members, this will be in uh, Dutch, I'm afraid, so just to be a bit more personal to what's wrong. <laughs> but you'll probably get some stuff from the pictures as well. Um, so yeah, I prepared a short talk about Robin's relationship with the Jossel, so we are in Nederland over schakelen. The verhouding between Robin and the Jossel, I think you know that. So we will see what there is going to be all the time. The most bizarre things are in the front of the uh, als terugkijk ik naar 2007, ik was eens terug gaan kijken op het internet om te zien welke foto's er op stonden van Robin. Maar je ziet de applicatie development skills kennende van de U-Hasselt. Ik denk dat ze uw oud fotootje gewoon nog eens geven, het meest recente fotootje. En ja, dat is dus het geval. Dus uh, geen historiek in de U-Hasselt applicaties. Maar gelukkig zijn er betere bronnen in de film. <lacht> Dan hebben we nog een CV gevonden van Robin. Van, uh, <lacht> Van zijn carrière met een heel mooi contrasterende kleurstelling, zoals je kunt zien. Uh, waarbij hij ook leidde dat hij uh, wat ervaring had met webontwikkeling en programmeren. Dus de eerste aanzet voor een doctoraat was heel al, zullen we zeggen. Dat en dan uh, ja, met heel wat uh, programmeertalen die hij onder de knie had, waarom ook JavaScript. Hè. Dus uh, ja, ik denk uh, er was ook al meteen een, misschien een aanleiding voor een doctoraat, hè, dus uh, in het, uh, 2007. Het vak inleiding tot webtechnologie, waar we ook nog de, de originele timing van hebt kunnen terugvinden van wanneer Robin ingeplant was in zijn sessie en ook al in de tussentijd een, een 
slagje dat we konden zien en uh, waar we uh, mochten naar uitkijken toen het finaal resultaat getoond werd. En ja, wat er natuurlijk niet mag ontbreken, is dat resultaat natuurlijk. Hè. Uh, je neemt het, iedereen zich deze nog wel herinnert die ook bij dat vak betrokken is geweest. De float or flush uh, website met uh, een mooie responsive design, hè, want het ging daar zelfs al daar moeten staan. Uh, maar het gaf wel een beetje aan waar het over gaat, maar helaas stond het beste vriendje er natuurlijk niet op. Hè. Maar dat heb je dan maar zelf gemaakt en dat was eigenlijk deze, de artist impression van hetgeen dat we daar eigenlijk te zien kregen op die, op die site. Het was niet exact deze, maar toch een variant die, die als ik niet vaak het zelf gemaakt heb. Het was eentje dat hierbij aansloot. En ja, niet alles van die even vlekkeloos bij Robin, net zoals hij nu vandaag de dag aan veel studenten verwijt. Ja. Dat is een van zijn kant ook, hè. Ja, bij een OO-project waarbij je verstanden vergeten waren waardoor het niet werkte. Niet maar vloeken op de studenten, maar zelf ook schuldig aan hetzelfde verzuim, willen we zeggen. Uh, of deze, waarbij we merkten dat er bij een bepaald project in de filmpjes die ingeleverd werden toch iets vreemds zat. Hè, waarbij we dan toch moesten vragen dat er al gewerkt was en een robot die nogal angstig was. Ik verschiet nogal van de bericht, is er iets mis? Hij had toch al schrik had dat, er, dat het eindresultaat uh, een niet zo goede score gepaard zou kunnen gaan. Dus, ja. dus hopelijk opletten wat je de studenten verweet. Ik zeg. En er waren ook heel wat memorabele projecten. Uh, aan de linkerkant het resultaat, denk ik, van hetgeen dat uh, rechts getoond. Ik ga het filmpje nu niet tonen, want het is zo'n veel te lang uh, leren. Het Eyeball project is ook iets waar uh, nog vaak naar gerefereerd wordt. Een project uh, dat jullie op YouTube kunnen nakijken en altijd kunnen terugvinden. Waar Robin zijn skills met uh, zijn collega Jimmy uh, in de verf zetten. En ja, voor de rest, hij was toch wel fier op zijn werk, duidelijk. Hè? Want als ik kijk naar bijvoorbeeld dit verhaal, hè, dus waarbij hij zijn, zijn CV eigenlijk uh, duidelijk maakt, ja, dat is toch wel een verbeterde versie van de vorige, zou ik zeggen. Hè? Dus al, uh, dat doet al iets meer aan de algemene richtlijn. Waarbij hij ook probeert, ja, de spelletjes die hij ontwikkeld heeft, uh, toch uh, wat meer duidelijkheid te geven. Nee, van dit vak weet ik niet, hè. die heb ik ook doorgekregen, maar wat dat die precies uh, ja, dat, uh, dat hebben ze mij niet kunnen uitleggen. Dat was alles niet een van mijn vakken. Maar goed, ja, blijkbaar uh, Robin ook skills met betrekking tot het modereren van het voorraad, blijkbaar op het uh, Dus uh, ja, misschien voor een herkansie, ik weet het niet. Um, en dan in 2009 kwamen we eigenlijk uh, ja, voor eerst echt met Robin in contact in de zin dat we iemand zochten voor vakantiewerk te doen. En Robin had al redelijk aangegeven dat hij daar wel interesse in had. En we hadden toen net een nieuw onderzoeksproject dat gestart was rond, was rond gaming. En we hadden dus ook wel mensen nodig om daar wat uh, proof of concepts voor te implementeren. En Robin is dan een van de kandidaten geweest die daar, uh, daar iets voor gedaan heeft. Dat was het eerste, dat we echt contact met Robin en skills dat we uh, gekregen hebben. En in 2011 was er de masterproef. De masterproef rond NVE's, het topic dat destijds hot was. Uh, we hadden een heel goed onderwerp uiteraard, ik heb er ook mijn doctoraat in gedaan. En Robin heeft daar heel mooi werk afgeleverd, ook werk uh, dat naderhand uh, geleid heeft tot nieuwe ontwikkelingen binnen het, uh, het onderzoek in, uh, in onze groep. En daarna vertrok Robin en ging hij uh, zijn eigen uh, gamebedrijf opstarten, en Lugge Studios. Ik weet niet dat het ook een hele hoge was dat jullie hadden, maar ja, ja, ja. ja toch wel. Ja, ik kon er geen, geen andere meer vinden. Uh, met de collega's hè, die uh, dat uh, mee opgericht hebben. Uh, eerst hier, ik denk dat dat ongeveer dagen was in het stadhuis. <laughs> ik weet het niet heel exact. Ja, exact ja. Uh, en daarna daar, hè, maar die weet ik wel dat het is, want daar heb ik mee opgestart op project. Dus, uh, ja, de incubator in Seamine, maar dat uh, Lucas toch wel het eerste. Een gamebedrijf in de Seamine was dat ook uh, uh, in de pers geweest is. Dus. Met heel wat producties, waaronder deze die teruggevonden hebben, de, de Augmented Spaceship Simulator, met het mooie acroniem dat er dan bij vond. <laughs> uh, ongetwijfeld nog veel andere producties, maar deze vond ik er dan toch wel tussen uitspringen, dus uh, die heb ik er dan maar ingeplakt. Hè. Maar ik denk dat je daar heel veel skills en ervaring op gedaan die je aantrekt moet kunnen gebruiken in, uh, in andere contexten. Dus heel, Belangrijk om dat gedaan te hebben, denk ik, om net dat praktische uh, er, goed, uh, er goed in te krijgen. En dan kwam Robin voor de eerste keer terug naar, uh, naar Iria. Uh, je had dan ook gevraagd of wij nog ergens een plaatsje hadden om hè, hem uh, te werk te stellen. Dat is waar heel tijd, naast zijn activiteiten uh, bij Lucas. En ja, 
Ik weet dat hebben wij ja gezegd, denk ik. Dat hadden we heel hard nodig, dat kan natuurlijk ook. Uh, en ja, toen uh, hebben we dan beslist om Robin inderdaad daar half tijd op, uh, op aan te stellen. En uh, de collega's bekend gemaakt hebben dat hij daar uh, terug van het uh, team deel zou gaan uitmaken. En dat was voor dit project, een project in het programma Innovatieve Media van het IWT destijds nog. Hè, uh, waarbij er eigenlijk uh, gestreefd werd om mediabedrijfjes en gamebedrijfjes samen te laten werken aan ja, alles wat met innovatieve media te maken had. En daar werkten we samen met heel wat uh, op dat moment bekende uh, partijen in het Vlaamse gamelandschap en die ook op een part en Larian Studios, die ondertussen nog iedereen kent en die nog uh, AAA-titels maken op dit moment. En met die mensen hebben we samengewerkt om dan uh, daar een, uh, een tof project mee te doen. En daar bleek dan al meteen interesse vanuit de politiek te zijn, want ik denk, we spreek mij tegen, maar ik denk dat we nooit over een van onze activiteiten een parlementaire vraag hebben gekregen, maar dat was dus wel het geval voor het project waar Robin op werkt. Ik weet niet of, we, of er een oorzaak een zakelijk verband is, maar het was toch wel heel opvallend dat we dat nooit meemaakten. En ze ziet ook nooit meer meegemaakt hebben, maar in het project was dat dus wel zo. Dus we moesten dan hè, apart een um, aanstoot verklaring maken van wat wordt dat project nu precies en wat zijn daar de, de gevolgen van. En dat was ook hè, het moment van de eerste paper, voor zover ik heb kunnen terugvinden. Samen met een, een aantal eh, mensen waar dat we eh, op dat moment mee samenwerkten, die ook tot heel recent aan het EDM betrokken waren. Uh, ja, ik denk de aanzet voor alles misschien, hè, zullen we zeggen. Op het begin. En meteen gevolgd door een tweede parlementaire vraag. <lacht> ja, ik zeg het, ongezien binnen het EDM in ieder geval. Ja, een vraag tot uitleg gekomen bij, bij ja, minister Witten. Hè. Geef me eens verhuurlijk bij dat project en hoe dat, dat, hoe dat in zijn werk gaat en wat dat precies inhoudt. Uh, en dan het resultaat ervan is dat ze dat programma meteen gecanceld hebben. Het project was goed gedaan en het was gedaan met heel project, met het hele programma. Dus je kon daar ook geen projecten meer in indienen. Of daar een zakelijk verband is nog niet zijn, ik weet het niet, maar het was toch wel opvallend. En toen verdween Robin weer even. Onder invloed van, ik ga me niet uitlaten, hè, ging hij naar eh, andere delen van het land en ging hij dus werken bij Udenlijk in Cartagena. Um, daar heb ik weinig informatie over over dat verleden, dus daar heb ik ook niet zijn, de deur door opgetekend in dit geval, maar ik had genoeg van de rest, dus dat is niet echt En toen was Robert opeens terug, hè, voor de tweede keer, hè, en voor degenen die de tel erbij horen. Uh, ja, met een hele uitleg tot hij vandaag was geweest en ja, dat hij dan toch terug kwam naar Hasselt en toch naar de opportuniteit om te komen werken, dat wij geen plaats hadden voor hem. Luc wou net op dat moment in die project hadden binnen de gehaald. Dat draaide rond web performance optimization. Uh, en ja, Robin was daar, was daar een goede kandidaat voor, denk ik. Hè. Dus uh, hebben we hebben daar ook uh, beslissing om hem daarop uh, erop aan te stellen. Hè. Dat was het eerste webproject, zullen we zeggen, ook in onze groep, denk ik. Hè. Dat we gedaan hebben dat echt specifiek op de, de protocollen en aanverwante zaken focuste. Samen met een heel aantal andere partijen uh, destijds en uh, ook met uh, wat, uh, wat commerciële partners, uiteraard. En ja hoor, dan uh, meteen de derde parlementaire vraag. Hm? Ja. <laughs> Ik was een beetje een patroon te zitten, want uh, ah, Philippe Meuters werd er dan nu vaak gesteld. Ja, zeg niet over die onderzoeksprogramma's, hè, waar het hier over gaat. Ja. <laughs> Totaal impressionant, dat ze zien nooit meer meegemaakt. Maar mijn Robinson project was altijd prijs om je daarvan. Ik weet niet wat je daarmee gedaan hebt, maar het is toch wel erg opvallend, moet ik zeggen. En dan ook uh, ja, daaruit voortvloeit de start van het, uh, van het doctoraat. Zo dus hebben we bij uh, destijds uh, ja, Flyer slash uh, FVO dan een aanvraag ingediend om strategisch basisonderzoek te mogen starten. En daar is eigenlijk alles uit, uit verder komen wat betreft het, uh, het doctoraat. Denk ik. Toen was het nog Web Performance Automation for the People. Hè, en daar is de, de titel wel een beetje veranderd. Uh, maar ja, goed, ik denk dat de eerste idee ook wel wel het waren, maar uiteindelijk bleek dat er nog interessante trajecten waren om te volgen. En we zijn toch met een heel mooi eindresultaat geëindigd, denk ik, hè, wat dat betreft. Heel wat presentaties die Robin gedaan heeft in zijn traject. Hè. Ik, uh, ik was er zelf niet bij, dus ik heb maar wat moeten zoeken wat ik op dit internet kon vinden. Dat is open source intelligence. Hè. <laughs> dit vond ik toevallig, hè. dus uh, cirkeltjes met mensen. Niemand had dat ergens gehad over een workshop uh, met andere uh, mensen die het over quick hebben, dus ik neem aan dat dat serieus was. En, en Robin die iets uitlegt met een uh, t-shirt of een, uh, een hoodie aan van Hasselt University. Um, en dan ja, ontdekte hij zijn grote liefde zo. Dat is zo in de Dus het is toch wel een gewoonte in huh? <laughs> En Dus uh, ik heb een kwik toch wel. Uh, ja. 
de grote liefde is geworden. Waarbij er ook het Wix Symposium heeft georganiseerd, hè, dat uh, ja, de, de experten uh, zeker in, in lokale, uh, lokale termen samengebracht om uh, eens te praten en van gedachten te wisselen over de laatste ontwikkelingen met, uh, met betrekking uh, tot, dat, uh, tot dat protocol. Dat was heel succesvol. We hebben een heel mooi event mee, mee georganiseerd hebben. In coronavrije tijden gelukkig nog. Uh, maar je hebt ook dit gedaan. Hè? <lacht> Geen details voor al de hè? maar ja. Uh, picture says more than a thousand words, of hoe zeggen ze dat. Hè? <lacht> dus ja, goed. We hebben de kosten achteraf toch maar vergoed hè, van de reis. Dus, uh, ja. En heel veel andere ambities voor 2020. Hè. Ik heb er wel maar een workflow van gemaakt. Hè, met een aantal dingen die, er, die erbij horen. Ja, het was niet genoeg om alleen maar dat op de raad af te ronden. Denk ik heb ook nog dat internship en dat boek schrijven. En heel wat andere ambities denk ik ook. En niet alles wat er op de raad staat. Dus, ja. Uh, ja, heel veel dingen die je probeert te combineren. Uiteindelijk om tot een, een heel mooi resultaat te komen. Ik denk dat dat ook wel vandaag gebleken is. Hè. Maar helaas, ja, op dit moment zitten we met een hè, speciale situatie, anders hadden we hier ongetwijfeld, hè, als ik kijk naar het aantal deelnemers thuis met 52 mensen daar straks, eh, hadden we het auditorium meer dan vol gekregen, hadden we misschien nog stoeletjes moeten bijzetten, denk ik, maar in coronatijden uiteraard, ja, we moeten ons aanpassen, hè. Het, het gaat niet anders. Uh, want anders hadden we vanavond dit kunnen doen, een lekker etentje, ik had al wat restaurants uitgezocht, hè, en uh, ook menukjes bekeken en zo, maar ja, helaas, dus geen optie. Dus het zal dit worden, voor mij althans. Dat ja. ja. zullen we het ook weer moeten doen. Dan zal zien de kosten terug voor dit keer. Uh, en dan is de vraag natuurlijk, ja, wat gaat er met Robin gebeuren na vandaag? Hè? Hij is daar heel stil over, maar ik heb toch al zo'n paar dingen opgevangen en het schijnt dat iets met dit te maken heeft. Ik ga daar geen oordeel over vellen, maar de pictures. <lacht> Dus Robin, remember this one, hè? <laughs> Goed, en die opdracht. <laughs> you never know, hè? Er is een boek over gemaakt. Alleen een beetje moeten aanpassen aan de titel, maar ja, dat is al twee keer teruggekomen. De vraag is, wanneer gaat die derde keer zijn? <laughs> We shall see. Hè? Dus, Robin, nogmaals, met de grond van mijn hart gefeliciteerd met uw resultaat. Heel mooi werk afgeleverd. Dus, Goed, voilà. Ja. Ik denk dat je ook ja, 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 dat de collega's ja. ook nog iets hadden voor bereid bij de categorie's. Ja, ja. Uh, kan ik invloeden daar? Of, uh, ja, we moeten even kijken om dat. Ik moet nog joinen, dan is het. Joinen ben ik al, ik moet gewoon in Oké, okay. dan uh, kan je gewoon deze pakken. Naar de nodig. Ja. Of moet ik zelf wat doen met dat? Dat is zelf nog iets gemakkelijker maken. Als ik het uh, mag ja. 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 Laugh through my camera laugh. Ik vind dat ik niet altijd onder mijn naam wordt gepost, dat ik er zo niks mee heb te maken. Hè. Ja. 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 Zet je nog een presentatie? Ja, dat is nog een presentatie. Ja, dat is zo. Oei. Zet die hier. Kun je hem boven neer? Dat weet ik eigenlijk niet. Ja, dat gaat wel. Ja, dat gaat wel. Ik ben Wacht, tablet. Ik denk dat ik dat kan doen. Ik mijn scherm aan die uh, zien de mensen thuis iets, want ik kan dat natuurlijk niet. Yes. Ik heb yes. dat wel yes. gekomen. Oké, okay, perfect. We zijn, we zijn al spoilers aan het geven. <laughs> dus, um, oh, ja. Ja. Uh, ik ga het ook in het Nederlands doen zonder mondmasker, dat is nog net iets gemakkelijker. Uh, ja, de, de, het, het, het acroniem S, ik, ik wist niet dat die in de, in de talk van P3 terugkomen, maar ik had daar eigenlijk ook een similar joke op gemaakt. Ik wou uh, beginnen met te zeggen: kijk, Robin, we hebben speciaal voor u dus een, een slide set gemaakt. Uh, en speciaal ook een protocol ontwikkeld om dat ding te gaan streamen. Uiteraard niet over Quick, want wie gebruikt Quick nu? Hè? Maar over TCP, en het was Adaptive Slide, slide Set Streaming, met andere woorden S. 
Met enig geduld komen we dus met andere woorden aan hetgeen dat u uiteindelijk wilt tonen. Nu Robin, we weten dat je allemaal enorm hard houdt van goede slides en goede talks. Dus al de expertise van de laatste jaren hebben we natuurlijk gecombineerd in de beste layouting die we maar konden maken van deze talk. En zoals je ziet, er zitten nog wel wat gaten in ijs, maar oh, good intended. Om mee te beginnen, uh, ja, Robin, jij had vorige week nog, dat is on, ja, bijna zeven dagen geleden ondertussen, uh, gezegd van ja, kijk, misschien moet ik toch mijn PhD maar uh, cancelen, want er zijn blijkbaar mensen die toch een beter idee hebben over hoe dat wij uh, überhaupt zaken op het internet moeten doen of zaken moeten optimaliseren. En uh, dat is misschien ook wel de waarheid, want hebben wij eigenlijk wel echt een nieuw transportleerprotocol nodig, Robin? Ik bedoel, we hebben al een prachtige RFC 1149, IP over Alien, die hier, waar je ook in je talk over hebt gehad. Uiteraard tot het een ultiem uh, protocol is, de dag van vandaag. En uh, we weten ook allemaal tot helpline blocking en HTTP prioritization eigenlijk bullshit is als je erover nadenkt. Want zoals je kunt zien, S is perfect capabel om dit perfect te streamen in een juiste volgorde. Maakt niet uit. Je moet zelf blijven praten, want anders kan ik een vieze tijd voelen die S moet om dit te kunnen streamen. En zoals altijd, de hero image moet als eerste komen. Hè. Dus waarom, waarom, waarom dan Quick, Robin? We hebben, we hebben ons prachtige duivenprotocol. Waarom nog Quick? En we zijn, we zijn eigenlijk eens een beetje beginnen graven in tweets en history en we zijn eigenlijk gewoon eens beginnen nadenken. Ja, wat, 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 wat drijft Robin er eigenlijk toe om dit te doen? En een van de conclusies die we eigenlijk hebben kunnen uittrekken is dat het misschien is omdat jij eigenlijk uh, shareholder bent van, van de fast food uh, quick. En als we dan teruggaan acht jaar geleden in de tijd in een van die tweets, dan zien we tot, wij een vraag, tot jij een vraag stelt, meer specifiek, naar Vincent van Quick in Wormen. En het meest vraag is, en ik nodig de mensen echt straks uit deze tweet terug te gaan opzoeken, als je deze link nu opent, kom je op de Quick website uit. Als je het nu nog probeert straks, je komt op de Quick, op de quick website uit. En dat is niet het enige bewijs dat we hebben gewonnen, hè, Robin? Nog maar een paar maanden geleden op Fosdum, een dag, en in de banner, sluikreclame voor de Quick. Hey, Robin, we hebben er eigenlijk weinig problemen mee, toch dat als je uh, shareholder bent. Misschien een korte hier en daar was wel vriendelijk geweest. Maar we suggereren ook naar de toekomst toe, uh, om misschien wat meer subtiel te zijn over dit soort elementen. En dan uiteraard, wie heeft ooit gezegd dat Quick geen acroniem is en nog geen... Twee jaar geleden heb jij op Delta B conference echt dit uh, geproclaimd. Quick UDP Internet Connections. Nu, we weten uiteraard allemaal dat die naam achteraf is veranderd. Maar toch heb je het weten. Ik blij met iets waarvoor je vandaag de dag papers die ik nog wat durven zeggen, onmiddellijk eigenlijk wegschuift. Nu, Quick, tot daar aan toe. Wat weten we nog over Robin? Robin is iemand die graag presenteert, goed presenteert. En hij haat uiteraard dan slechte slide sets en slechte shows. Maar misschien is dat gewoon een self-inflicted element, omdat van het feit dat hij er zelf ooit gewoon heel slecht in was. En we hebben deze foto teruggevonden die daar eigenlijk wel een goed bewijs van is. En nog zo'n element, Robin. Waarom al de superhero references? Altijd Aquaman, Batman, uiteraard de sidekick Robin, Superman. Is het misschien omdat je zelf een superhero was zijn? <lacht> Of misschien een zwaardvechter, ook uiteraard een optie, uiteraard geoptimaliseerd voor het Pitching-protocol. Misschien een danser, ook altijd een optie. Oei, dat houdt hier wel een beetje weg, maar het effect is wel daar. Of misschien gewoon een fan van shit pop music, ook altijd een optie. Of misschien identificeert Robin zichzelf als een Apache-helikopter, ook een optie. Zoals we zien, Robin is een man van veel talenten. Nu, Robin heeft ook heel veel talks gegeven, maar het zijn al aangehaald geweest, zelfs inclusief in de verdediging. Uh, we hoeven niet verder binnen te gaan. En misschien is de reden waarom Robin zo goed in het geven van talks is, omwille van het feit dat hij eigenlijk met Diamond is. Of misschien toch gerelateerd aan met Diamond. Want we zijn eens gaan opzoeken. En deze vage familie tree geeft misschien wel een idee van waar we komen. We Karl Marx, daar kunnen we uiteraard niet onderuit. Cedric Dujardin, de CEO van Quick. Met Damon. En ergens is toch Robin uitgekomen. Als we gaan kijken naar een facemorf, dan zien we de gelijkenissen toch wel echt duidelijk. In die end, nobody knows, it's all guessing work. Maar we zitten volgens mij wel dicht op de waarheid. Nu, even terugkeren naar het heden. We hebben gisteren heel altijd gezien van, van, van Google. En we zijn eens beginnen zoeken, Robin. En we denken toch jij er iets mee te maken hebt. 
En uh, die ene daarvoor is, we hebben dit gevonden. Hackers uh, of Google Found. Als we inzoomen op die picture, wie zien we dan op de achtergrond? Ja, Oké, om iets te vertellen, jongeman. <laughs> um, en als we alles in context plaatsen, dan begint het op een keer veel duidelijker te worden. Deze tweet, de difference between dirty hack en protocol is een standardization process. Dirty hack, ja, ja, Robin. Ik denk dat we hier al op het juiste spoor zitten. En tot we met grote duidelijkheid kunnen zeggen dat jij eigenlijk hacker mij onder ons allemaal zit. Maar waarom, Robin? Robin, we zijn nog een stukje verder gegaan. Hacker mij is misschien niet het enige dat je zit. Maar als we gaan kijken naar tweets, dan vinden we steeds meer subtilians. Oh, die laatste regel. My VM crashes often and I usually have about 666 tabs open. 666? Toch niet heel toevallig. Nummer van de beast? Robin? Ah, oh, je kan het spijtig nu ook niet door. Maar ik denk dat ik de reference maar al te goed begreep. Yes. Maar nee, de beast is misschien nog te ver gezocht. Dr. Evil. En ik denk dat deze studenten van deze PV een tijdje terug maar al te goed door hadden wat er aan de hand is. Dus vooral die kat die af en toe is passeerd, die de duidelijke hints dropt. Of misschien ook gewoon niet. En spijtig genoeg komt deze audio ook niet door. Maar ik nodig u uit om het straks nog eens thuis te bekijken. We zullen ze sharen met u. Dus, of, een, of misschien ondertussen al Dr. My Little Robin. Uh, er is een tijd van komen en er is spijtig genoeg een tijd van gaan. En ik weet in ieder geval dat hij hier liever op het EDM zou blijven staan. Um, maar het is met veel liefde in het hart dat we u eigenlijk gaan moeten buiten gooien om naar uw opportuniteit te gaan. <lacht> dat concludeert bij uh, onze mooie slide set die we voor u hebben gemaakt. Uh, ja, dank u. <lacht> Ik geef de laatste woorden voor deze plechtigheid zijn voor Dr. Marx zelf. Oeh, Dr. Marx. Dr. Marx. Dus we moeten nou gewoon hier raken. Dat is weer een hier bij ons. Dat is weer. Ik ga niet langer houden. Ik wil gewoon zeggen to Thanks to everyone today for coming, um, for supporting me throughout this. Um, special thanks to, to my family, my parents, my, <laughs> my sister. <laughs> I'm sorry for using you in the presentation, uh, as well as, of course, it's, it's Deborah. Uh, but she already knew what was coming, so. <laughs> um, it's been an amazing uh, uh, four or five years. It's something that at the same time I want to repeat and also never again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, with that, I'm just uh, just very very happy that you have all been here to to celebrate me with this, and I'm happy that uh, I uh, I didn't have to use this after all uh, in the PhD. So uh, thank you all, and hopefully see you all in person uh, sometime next year uh, for a bit more personal celebration. Thanks. Dan deze officiële zitting. Jammer genoeg kunnen we niet afsluiten met een receptie zoals dat gewoonlijk het geval is. Na nou, de omstandigheden zijn waar ze zijn. Uh, ik wil iedereen nog eens bedanken, de leden van de jury in het bijzonder. En ook het uh, talrijk opgekomen uh, publiek. Hè. Uh, Peter heeft er nog uh, referentie naar gemaakt, meer dan 50 uh, aanwezigen. Online is niet hetzelfde dan wanneer ze hier in de zaal zouden zitten, maar toch, uh, ik hoop dat het ook een klein beetje hè, als een steun heeft uh, gediend tijdens uw uh, verdediging. En het maakt toch het geheel uh, een beetje warmer, zeker nu vlak voor de kerstperiode. Dus nog eens proficiat namens ons uh, allen en uh, aan uh, iedereen ook dank om uh, hier aan te ook al was het dan op afstand aanwezig te zijn. Okay. Oh. 
Zet er vanaf, Robert. Oh, oh, oh. Echt waar? Ik zie je wel eens. Ja, ik zie je wel eens.